world filled with millions of wonders, there are places so dangerous that setting foot on their land or sailing through their waters is like playing with death itself. Stunning mountains that touch the sky, where every step can be the last for the brave souls who dare to climb them. Or an island filled with thousands of venomous snakes. Or deserts where extremely high temperatures put every living organism to the test. And lakes that may seem calm at first glance, but in reality hide deadly secrets in their depths. The most radioactive water body in the world, which is more toxic than Chernobyl. And what about a boiling lake that looks like a gigantic natural cauldron? And finally, the most dangerous parts of the world ocean. Seas where ships disappear without a trace, and where sailors witness inexplicable phenomena. Or a bottomless underwater cave that holds the stories of dead divers. All of this is just a small part of our big journey. Today, we'll explore the most sinister and darkest corners of the planet, the most dangerous places on Earth. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to make sure you don't miss our videos. Imagine you are standing on an uninhabited island, and dozens and hundreds of slippery, crawling bodies are rustling around you. You start to choke with fear. Your heart is racing. You look around and see snakes. They are everywhere you look, even on the trees. It seems like you are in a nightmare, but you are not. This is just one of the scariest places on our planet, and there are many more of them. We have picked for you the top places you'd better never go to. 15 Most Dangerous Places in the World At first glance, it looks like a paradise island with palm trees and a sunny climate. And the name Bikini Atoll surely reminds you of something. Yes, yes, the action of the famous Nickelodeon animated series SpongeBob SquarePants mainly takes place in the fictional underwater town of Bikini Bottom, which is supposedly located under Bikini Atoll. But this island actually has a very grim history. The atom bomb is here. It exists. We must look to the future. Up until now, only three have been exploded, and none over the water. It was here on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands that the U.S. conducted nuclear weapons tests from 1946 to 1958. And just nearby, on Eniwatok Atoll, the first hydrogen bomb was tested on November 1, 1952. Bikini was chosen because of its remote location and spacious and easily accessible lagoon, and the inhabitants were asked to move to a neighboring atoll. After a council with elders, the ruler Paramount Eroj of Bikini inhabitants agreed, and 167 indigenous inhabitants moved to Rongeric Atoll. Unfortunately, the trees and palms of the new home were not so fruitful. Fresh water was not enough, and there were food poisoning cases. The Bikini Atoll's indigenous people were subsequently relocated several more times. But back to the tests. The operation in 1946 was called Crossroads. It involved dozens of warships and airplanes, 25,000 radiation meters, and thousands of laboratory animals were brought to the atoll. There were two tests, codenamed Abel and Baker. During Abel, a bomb was dropped on 73 warships, and the 21 kiloton Baker bomb, dubbed the Helen of Bikini, exploded at a depth of 27 meters, 88.6 feet. Feel what happened at that moment. Two million tons of water, sand, and powdered coral exploded into the air. The explosion literally shredded the ocean bottom. Scientists who examined it 73 years later found that it had never leveled out. The target ships and the atoll as a whole were heavily contaminated with radioactive material, 
But at the time, few people realized how severe the contamination would be. Years later, the level of radiation from the impact has significantly decreased. But the problem of contamination from the sunken ships remains. It was just that during the tests, the ships had to be left in full combat readiness. That is, they still had fuel and ammunition. As a result, fuel continues to leak from the Japanese Navy's flagship, Nagato, spreading for miles. The third bikini test, codenamed Castle Bravo, took place in 1954. A hydrogen bomb was detonated over the atoll. The explosion was 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Up to 100 Japanese schooners were exposed to radiation, and 457 tons of tuna were spoiled. 192 kilometers, 119 miles from Bikini, radiation levels reached 1,000 row engines per hour, while 600 row engines is already lethal to humans. Overall, it was the most powerful of the nuclear tests in U.S. history. They continued for another four years, until 1958. As a result, Bikini became uninhabitable. The soil and water became contaminated, so that farming and fishing were no longer possible. More than half of the 167 indigenous people of Bikini Atoll died due to severe radiation-related diseases. The U.S. later paid the descendants of the Bikini Atoll's inhabitants $83 million in compensation for damages from nuclear tests and relocation from their home island. There are now four to six caregivers living on the atoll. Now, let's move to another island you'd better also avoid but for a completely different reason. What could be hiding there? Giant lizards? Aliens? Traces of ancient civilizations? In fact, this place has become a haven for people who have been called devils and bloodthirsty demons. We bet you wouldn't want to encounter them after such a presentation. What makes them so dangerous? Officially, the North Sentinel is governed by India. But in reality, this Andaman Island in the Bay of Bengal, about the size of Manhattan, 58.8 square kilometers, 22.7 square miles, is a real thing in itself. Its inhabitants are the most isolated tribe in the world, unwilling to embrace civilization. Yes, yes, they don't know what the dollar, global warming, and online movie theaters are. The Sentinelese forbid outsiders from coming to their island and kill those who try to get to them. The last time their ferocity was brought up was in 2018. That was when a 26-year-old American missionary, John Chow, who arrived on Sentinel without permission from Indian authorities, tried to land on the island to convert the natives to Christianity. Chow brought a Bible and souvenirs. The indigenous people made signs ordering him to get out. But the young American did not give up, and next time, he persuaded the fishermen who had brought him to leave him on the shore. It ended tragically. Chow was shot with an arrow, and the fishermen who saw the guy's body being dragged along the shore were arrested for having brought him there illegally. But even before Chow, encounters with islanders ended badly. In 2006, for example, two fishermen went to the Sentinel to catch crabs. They wanted to negotiate with the islanders, but they killed them immediately. The Sentinelese were not even afraid of the helicopter that came for the bodies and showered it with arrows. This hatred for the iron birds can be explained. Two years before, there was a severe tsunami, and the local authorities decided to help the indigenous people. They dropped off food supplies and essentials while accidentally killing one of the Sentinelese with a sack. The issue is complicated by the fact that no one knows or understands the language of the islanders. It is not even known what they call themselves, nor is it known how many people live on the island. This makes the North Sentinel one of the most mysterious places on the planet. Now, India is trying to protect the islanders from outside invasion. By law, it is forbidden to approach the North Sentinel any closer than 8 kilometers, 5 miles. 
Indian researchers believe that the Sentinelese should just be left alone and allowed to live the way they do. Another reason is that the islanders have no immunity to diseases that are common in the rest of the world. These diseases can simply kill them. But the island and its inhabitants are very interesting for the tourists who visit the neighboring tribes. So can they be protected in the age of globalization? We don't know, but we'd better stay away from them for now. Meanwhile, staying away from the next subject of our top 15 is not so easy, at least for the locals. At the end of August 2010, the Cinnabung Stratovolcano woke up after 400 years of sleep. The giant with a height of 2,460 meters, 8,070 feet, is located in the north of Sumatra Island in Indonesia. People have been settling near it for ages, not realizing how dangerous it is. Indonesia is located on the tectonic faults of the Pacific Ring of Fire and ranks first in the world by the number of volcanoes. There are 147 of them in the country, of which 130 are active, and as many as 9 million Indonesians live close to active volcanoes, that is, within 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles from them. Since Cinnabung came out of hibernation, it has erupted almost every year sometimes several times a year. As a result, airplanes flying through the region have to change their routes. Each eruption is accompanied by the evacuation of between 6,000 and 20,000 locals. But sometimes, things end tragically. In 2014, for example, this fire-breathing monster took at least 16 lives because people living within 5 kilometers, 3.1 miles from it, were allowed to return home when they thought the eruption had stopped. But shortly after, the volcano erupted again. A journalist who wanted to take a closer shot was killed, as were four children from a local school, along with a teacher who decided to observe the eruption. In 2016, the volcano killed seven more people and seriously injured three others. And it was an epic show when it woke up. A column of ash and smoke rose to a height of 3 kilometers, 1.9 miles. 12,000 residents of surrounding villages had to be evacuated from their homes. But that proved to be just the beginning. In the evening of the same day, the outbursts continued. At the same time, an earthquake struck, affecting an area within 25 kilometers, 15.5 miles of the epicenter. A few more days later, Cinnabung fired a third portion of ash. The sound of the explosion could be heard at a distance of 8 kilometers, 5 miles. In 2021, the volcano erupted as many as five times, starting in January and ending in July. Last time, in addition to a 4.5 kilometer, 2.8 mile high column of dust and gas, there were also pyroclastic flows, destructive streams of volcanic debris that spread one kilometer, 0.6 miles from the mouth of the volcano. They outpace even airplanes in speed, reaching 700 kilometers per hour, 435 miles per hour, and their temperatures reach 800 degrees Celsius, 1,472 degrees Fahrenheit which is deadly to any living creatures in the vicinity. But we've had enough of high temperatures. Let's move to the coldest inhabited place on Earth. The pipes freeze here, so most toilets are outbuildings with no water supply. The ground also freezes, and there are very few plants, so you would have to eat mostly meat and fish, sometimes in frozen form. Vegetarians, this is not the right place for you. The engines here freeze so fast that they are not turned off sometimes, even at night. And when you walk on the street, your eyelashes get covered with frost. It's a place where winter is coming all the time. Welcome to Oimayakan, a remote Yakut village in eastern Siberia near the Arctic Circle. In 1924, 
the temperature dropped to a record low of minus 71.2 degrees Celsius, minus 96.2 degrees Fahrenheit. The average winter temperature is minus 50 degrees Celsius, minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. The village itself was founded in the 1920s. Here, shepherds used to water their reindeer from the thermal spring in winter. During the shortest days of the year, the night in Oymayakan lasts 21 hours. Every March, the village hosts the Pole of Cold Festival, which is the name given to the areas with the lowest temperatures. According to beliefs, the festival is held by Chaiskan, the Yakut spirit of cold. He looks like something between Gandalf and the Ice Queen from Frozen. In summer, the temperatures in Oymayakan can reach 35.5 degrees Celsius, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the daily temperature swings are large, and it can be 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, 59 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit cooler at night than it is during the day. No wonder that the pole of cold has become a point of attraction for record lovers. In 2019, for example, Oymayakan hosted the world's first ever race in record low temperatures. At the time of the start, the temperature was minus 48 degrees Celsius, minus 54.4 degrees Fahrenheit. It lasted four hours, and during this time, runners covered several different distances. The participants were from France, India, Italy, Austria, and Taiwan. A resident of Japan also dared to do an extreme act. He bathed in Oymayakan in the river at a temperature of minus 60 degrees Celsius, minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. The man ran out of the van in his underwear, plunged into the water several times, and came back. His photo was later posted on YouTube and gained over 200,000 views. It's chilling to even look at, isn't it? This one of the most dangerous places in the world has also become one of the most romantic ones at the same time. Swiss Patrick Baumann proposed to his French girlfriend, Anne Severine Boulard. The couple came to Oymayakan specifically for this purpose and made a movie about it. However, Anne couldn't put the ring on because of the frost. I hope you didn't get too cold here because we're moving on back to one hot place. If you are looking for an adrenaline rush, this is the place for you. The Donakil Desert stretches over 136,956 square kilometers, 52,879 square miles across Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Djibouti. So you don't have to go to space at all to see Martian landscapes. Here in the Donakil Desert, they are formed by salt deposits. The Afar people who inhabit this area have been mining salt for centuries. It was used as currency in Ethiopia until the 20th century. Its thick deposits, in some places up to 800 meters, 2,625 feet deep, and the petrified corals that have been found here suggest that there used to be an ocean on the place of this desert. And imagine, you are standing under the ruthless sun feeling the salt brought by the wind on your lips and inhaling the air filled with poisonous gases. Yes, yes, even breathing in the Donakil Desert is harmful. That's because the air contains high concentrations of poisonous sulfur vapors. Therefore, researchers believe that even a short stay in this desert can impact health. The temperature is no less dangerous. During the day, it exceeds 50 degrees Celsius, 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and generally, it rarely falls below this mark. There is only 25 millimeters, one inch of rainfall per year. No wonder it is one of the hottest and most lifeless places in the world. Part of the desert is the Donakil Depression, one of the lowest places on the planet. It is 125 meters, 410 feet below sea level. On winter mornings, the temperature here may well fluctuate around 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and the overall maximum temperature is 63 degrees Celsius, 145.4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
It is not for nothing that British researcher Wilfred Thesiger called the Donakil Desert the land of death. And a group of researchers in 2016 studied whether microbes could live in reservoirs of boiling water found in the Donakil Desert. This way, they wanted to find out whether similar organisms could survive on Mars. And it turned out that these organisms could survive in such a harsh environment. But you wouldn't like these hot springs. Their water has an average pH of 0.2, which means it's about as acidic as battery acid. The Donakil Desert is also a volcanically active area. Here, just in the depression, there is a dormant volcano, Ayelu, and active volcanoes, Dalal and Irtale. Who knows when they will decide to erupt? All this increases the risk of staying in this place, adding points to its dangerous reputation. Nevertheless, tourists actively strive to come here, despite the dangers, or maybe just because of them. In the next place of our top 15, breathing is no less difficult. If you decide to stay here for longer than 10 minutes, you can get heat stroke and your lungs can fill up with fluid. No, you are not on the edge of a volcano but in the Cave of the Crystals in Mexico. The place resembles Superman's Fortress of Solitude. The cave was discovered in 2000. A mining company called Industrias Peñoles in the Mexican state of Chihuahua pumped water out of it. And two brothers, miners Juan and Pedro Sanchez, were amazed when their flashing lights caught the glow of giant crystals. No, not Swarovski, out of the darkness but they were no less beautiful. It was selenite, a crystalline variety of gypsum. These were real columns you could walk on. Many crystals were four to six meters, 13.1 to 19.6 feet long, and the largest were 11 meters, 36 feet. They were about one meter, 3.2 feet thick. How did this amazing natural masterpiece form? The crystals grew for at least 500,000 years at a depth of 300 meters, 984 feet beneath the Sierra de Naica. Tectonic fault lines run through this area. About 26 million years ago, magma began to move through them, and eventually the mountain was formed. And the cave itself is a U-shaped cavity in the limestone under the mountain. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, it contained the mineral anhydrite. The magma beneath the cave kept the water hot, but eventually its temperature dropped to just under 58 degrees Celsius, 136 degrees Fahrenheit. And the anhydrite began to break down in the new conditions, decomposing into calcium and sulfate. The particles began to slowly form a crystalline form of gypsum, otherwise known as selenite. The cave began to fill with selenite crystals. They stayed underwater and grew steadily. Of course, they didn't turn into giants overnight. For example, it takes 500,000 to 900,000 years for a crystal with a diameter of one meter, 3.2 feet, to grow. By the way, this cave with selenite was not the first one discovered. In 1910, Another cavity was found 120 meters, 394 feet above the Cave of the Crystals at a depth of 120 meters, 394 feet. It was called the Cave of Swords because its crystals resembled these cold weapons, but the selenite outgrowths in it were much smaller, no more than 2.5 meters, 8.2 feet long. Most probably the reason for this is that the Cave of Swords cooled down much faster and the crystals simply did not have time to grow larger. However, this beauty can also be deadly. It is rumored that one guest to the giant crystals cave was literally impaled by a satellite spike from the vault when he tried to break it off. The atmosphere itself can kill you here. The temperature in this wonder of the world is around 47.1 degrees Celsius, 113 degrees Fahrenheit, and the humidity is almost 100%. Therefore, it is impossible to stay here for long without special clothing. In 2017, the pumping of water stopped, 
so the crystals can start to grow again. Mere mortals are still not allowed to enter this place. Well, we are going to move to another hard to reach and harsh place. And don't be surprised if you notice suspiciously many dead animals and birds here. This place in Kamchatka is called the Death Valley, and it really deserves this name. The bodies of wolverines, foxes, stellar sea eagles, lynxes, wolves, gophers, mice, hares, and ermines have been found in this area, and the list is only growing. In fact, the Death Valley is a small area at an altitude of 850 meters, 2,789 feet at the foot of the Kikpinyach Volcano in the Kronotsky Nature Preserve. It is about 2 kilometers, 1.2 miles long, and 100 to 500 meters, 328 to 1,640 feet wide. This place becomes a trap mainly for small mammals and birds. A full chain begins. First, sparrows die. Then, foxes that come for them. Then, wolverines and bears that come for foxes. And the birds include crows and golden eagles. What kills the animals and birds? Is there some kind of mystical phenomenon here? In fact, the reason is a high concentration of gases. Hydrogen sulfide, carbon sulfide, and carbon dioxide. They float right above the ground, killing, first of all, small animals. Gas jets rise from great depths. These places can be distinguished by sulfur plaque. Especially many hazardous volatile substances accumulate in cloudy, windless weather in natural niches. There are not so many of them in open terrain, so they are not dangerous. It all starts in late spring. The snow on the thermal sites melts and the bare ground attracts birds. They search there for seeds or insects and become victims of poisonous gases that have a nerve agent action and living creatures die within seconds. And then the already mentioned chain starts. But sometimes even large predators are at risk when heavy poisonous gases squeeze the air to a height of up to 50 centimeters. Bodies are preserved for a very long time because bacterial activity is suppressed in the poisonous atmosphere. Researchers have estimated that since 1975, that is, since the valley was discovered, about 25 bears have died because of the gas concentration. And between 1975 and 1983, reserve staff collected more than 200 animal bodies. There were 12 species of mammals and 15 species of birds among them. By the way, herbivorous animals die much more rarely here because the slopes have no vegetation and therefore do not attract them. And how would these gases affect you? You would feel pain and heat in the back of your neck, dizziness, it would be difficult to breathe, and there would be a bad taste in your mouth. But once you could stand in a ventilated area, you'd feel better again pretty soon. But you would definitely not feel good anywhere near the next object in our top 15. Steep paths on its slopes are dangerous. Sulfur gases are poisonous. And occasional gas releases have taken the lives of many miners. We're talking about Asian Volcano on the island of Java in Indonesia. It is a whole complex consisting of more than a dozen volcanic sites around a caldera, that is, a hollow. These are stratovolcanoes, craters, volcanic cones. Here, you can see an amazing show. The volcano slopes are enveloped in blue flames. How does it happen? Hot and flammable sulfuric gases are emitted from fumaroles, i.e. cracks. Their temperature reaches 600 degrees Celsius, 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit. When they come into contact with oxygen in the air, they ignite and begin to burn with an electric blue flame. Some of the gas condenses in the atmosphere and forms streams of molten sulfur, which also burn with blue fire. You can admire the unusual landscape at night. In the daytime, it is little noticeable. Also in the caldera, there is a sulfurous lake, Kawa Ijin. The water in it is of turquoise color, 
although sometimes it changes its shade during the day. This color is caused by extreme acidity and high concentration of dissolved metals. This is the largest acid lake in the world. Its pH is only 0.5, while the normal value is 11 to 15 times higher. That is, the lake's acidity is like that of a battery. And if you rinse your mouth with water from it, your teeth will fall out. The reason is the inflow of gas-saturated hydrothermal water from the hot magmatic source below. The lake is 200 meters, 656 feet deep, and one kilometer, 0.6 miles wide. Its shores are a large natural deposit of natural sulfur. When sulfur-containing gases burst from fumaroles, they ignite only if they are hot. But the temperature is often so low that the sulfur condenses, falls to the ground as a liquid, flows, and solidifies. This eventually creates a renewable sulfur deposit. Locals mine it and deliver it to a nearby factory. This is one of the top paying jobs for country residents. They earn $12 to $17 a day for it. But it is also extremely dangerous. The smell of sulfur smoke is very strong. It smells a bit sour and sometimes resembles the smell of fried eggs. If it gets into the mouth or nose, a person begins to suffocate. That's why locals use respirators. Experienced miners may carry a load of sulfur much heavier than their body weight. To get the job done, they have to climb up a steep mountainside and then walk down dangerous rocky paths. To make it easier to collect the sulfur, miners have installed pipes that capture the gases from the numerous fumaroles and direct them to one place. But sometimes even this does not help. In the last 40 years, 74 miners have died because of smoke that suddenly escaped the cracks in the rock. The next place on our top 15 list has no sulfur, but many other threats. Do you think beauty cannot be deadly? This statement is refuted by the Death Valley National Park in California. This is one of the most popular places among tourists, and yet it harbors a lot of dangers. This area got its name in 1849 during the gold rush. At that time, a group of settlers wanting to get to the gold mines faster decided to take a shortcut through the desert. But one man never made it to the destination. The others crossed the valley, hungry and thirsty, and decided to call it Death Valley. Despite the fact that only one person died here, it was a tragedy for the rest of the people so the name quickly caught on. So what are the dangers? The first is the temperature. Death Valley is the hottest and driest place in North America. Just imagine, this place gets less than five centimeters or two inches of rainfall per year, and the highest recorded temperature is 56.7 degrees Celsius, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Such extreme temperatures have claimed the lives of many people. In 2023 alone, a 71-year-old man died here due to heat stroke. In winter, the valley is no less dangerous. Temperatures drop to zero and below, and snow and ice can cause sudden flooding on the valley bottom. Wouldn't that stop you from visiting? Then let's move on. The next danger is wild animals, of which there are many in the park so it's best not to check any suspicious places with your hands and feet. Poisonous rattlesnakes with sharp fangs, black widow spiders, and scorpions can lurk there. You may also find desert rabbits, desert tortoises, large lizards, dog-like coyotes, and wild sheep. In general, though, the valley is home to many species of birds, mammals, and reptiles. Another danger is hantavirus, which causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. It has been found in Java mouse deer and cactus mice. It is a severe respiratory disease that is fatal for humans. It is spread by rodents or their excrement. So, if you decide to travel to Death Valley, stay away from the huts and mine buildings. There are plenty of rodents there. Another danger is the mines and tunnels you may stumble upon don't enter them. We've warned you. 
there could be explosive gas, foul air, or dangerous wild animals in there. Well, last but not least, we cannot forget to mention the flooding that happens when the rain finally comes. The national park is surrounded by valleys, so flash floods are likely to occur. In 2022, flooding here caused all roads to be closed, and hundreds of people were virtually stuck inside Death Valley National Park. But let's move to an area that is no less formidable, where people also have to get used to extreme conditions. Would you risk tasting radioactive octopus or bathing in radioactive water? And some have no choice. On March 11, 2011, a nine-magnitude earthquake struck Japan in the waters of the Pacific Ocean, northeast of Tokyo. It was the most powerful earth tremors in this country in the history of modern observations. They triggered a tsunami, monstrous 30 to 40 meter, 98 to 131 feet high waves demolished houses, cars, and airplanes at airports. The two disasters killed nearly 20,000 people and more than 2,500 are reported missing. The earthquake de-energized the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and the tsunami flooded basements with diesel generators. Emergency cooling systems at the plant failed and nuclear fuel melted in the reactors of three units. This eventually led to a series of explosions and the release of radioactive substances into the atmosphere. The area remains contaminated to this day. The exclusion zone reaches for 20 to 30 kilometers, 12 to 19 miles. The accident did not outstrip Chernobyl, but it was the worst nuclear power plant disaster of the 21st century. But it could have been avoided. Fukushima Daiichi was built by TEPCO. It was their first nuclear power plant. The initial mistake was building the plant too close to the ocean. And the second mistake was that the maximum designed load was a 7 magnitude earthquake and a 3.1 meter, 10 feet high tsunami. This was despite the fact that seismologists warned of the risk of a massive tsunami in the Fukushima Daiichi area back in 2002. More than 10 years after the accident, Fukushima is gradually recovering. Residents of the hastily abandoned towns are returning home and tourists are already traveling to the local exclusion zone. But if you think that's the end of the problems with Fukushima Daiichi, you're wrong. In order to avoid even worse consequences of the 2011 tsunami, the shutdown nuclear reactors had to be cooled down additionally. Heat is released from them. Because of this, as much as 170 tons of tritium-contaminated water is generated every day. As a result, about 1.3 million tons of radioactive water has accumulated in the plant's tanks. This volume could fill 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Since the tanks were full, the water began to be drained into the ocean. Before doing so, TEPCO filters it to remove isotopes other than tritium, which is difficult to separate. This water is then diluted with seawater. They plan to discharge about 460 tons per day. Discharging all the water from the nuclear power plant will take about 30 years. But the country's authorities claim that the fish caught in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant are safe for human health. Japan's prime minister and several ministers even tasted seafood caught off the coast of Fukushima. Would you risk it? Visiting the next location on our list is also risky. And yet, it is extremely popular. On this island, you can get hurt due to various factors. Car accidents, drowning, broken neck due to diving in shallow water, and snake bites. Also, great white sharks are often seen close to the shore of the eastern part of the island. An additional danger is posed by the strong currents. You are on Fraser Island, or Kagari as the locals call it. With 500,000 tourists visiting the island every year, it's hard to believe that it has so many dangers when you look at its idyllic beauty. Alas, beauty and danger go side by side here. Dreadful tides are a regular occurrence here, but it's the local wildlife that's the most dangerous. There are small blue bottles living around the island. These are jellyfish, which have a distinctive blue color. 
They sting 10,000 people each year across Australia. When they sting, they release a poison that causes severe pain, fever, and even death. Blue bottles often come in groups and can sting even if they have been washed ashore. The Irukandji jellyfish are even more dangerous. These are the smallest jellyfish. They are only one cubic centimeters, 0.06 cubic inches in size, but are extremely venomous. Their toxin causes a condition known as Irukandji syndrome. It sends over 50 people to hospitals every year with the threat of fatal brain hemorrhage. Another dangerous inhabitant of the island is the wild dingo dog. These animals look very cute, but it's important to remember, these are ferocious creatures, not cute puppies from your neighborhood. There are over 200 dingoes on Fraser. They have attacked tourists several times. There was a case of a young boy who walked away from his family and was attacked and killed by several dingoes in 2001. Plus, the island is home to 18 species of snakes a third of which are venomous and extremely dangerous to humans. These include the eastern brown snake, which is the second most venomous snake in the world. It kills 50 to 60 people a year. Where else would you find such a heavenly place with so many dangers? Now, let's move to another continent, to the peak. The risk of avalanches, ice falls, simple falls, hypothermia, extreme fatigue and exhaustion, and illnesses associated with very low oxygen content. This is what the brave hearts on Everest face. Of all deaths of foreign mountaineers while climbing Everest, 35% were due to falls, 22% due to exhaustion, 18% due to altitude sickness, and 13% due to hypothermia. In the vast majority of cases, Climbers have bad luck during the descent, either after successfully reaching the summit or after turning back before reaching the summit. The culprits here are extreme fatigue or prolonged exposure to extremely low oxygen conditions. The Sherpa, i.e. Nepalese mountain guides, are more likely to die on the lower parts of the climb because they spend a lot of time preparing the route and get injured. Why do people take such risks? Let us remind you that Mount Everest is the highest peak in the world. Its summit is 8,849 meters, 29,032 feet above sea level. May 29, 2023 is the 70th anniversary of the first successful ascent of Mount Everest, but 2023 was also one of the deadliest years in the history of records. A total of 12 climbers died, and several more went missing. And that's despite the fact that almost all people climbing Everest undergo special training and prepare for physical, psychological, and technical difficulties. Such preparation can take months or even years. They acclimatize, sleep in tents at altitude, or train in chambers that simulate a low oxygen environment. They also climb other summits exceeding 6,000 meters 19,685 feet. The top of the mountain, that is the area above 7,925 meters, 26,000 feet, is called the death zone. There is little oxygen there, so climbers feel drowsy, disoriented, and tired, and things feel heavier. In other words, despite extensive training, the risks are still there, and climbers die every season. According to the Himalayan database, more than 310 people have lost their lives on Everest in a hundred years, from 1922 to 2022. During that time span, 16,000 non-Sherpa climbers attempted to ascend the summit. More than a third of them, 5,633 people, succeeded. By the way, on their way up, they all had a terrible sight waiting for them the bodies of their less successful fellow climbers. In total, there are about 200 bodies on Everest, which serve as a grim warning to others. It is dangerous to try to remove them. Several rescuers died trying to do so, so most climbers lie where they fell. Speaking of falls, we cannot fail to mention the next place. Year after year, people die here. 
Some seek adventure. Some depend on this road, but it's a risky trip for all of them. The Road of Death, or formerly Camino Las Yungas, is a section of road between the cities of La Paz and Coroico. It is narrow and rocky, averaging 3.2 meters, 10 feet in width. There is a cliff on one side and a terrible abyss on the other. Travelers on the Road of Death experience steep serpentines and sharp turns. It is dangerous to drive here at any time of the year. In summer, there are often rock falls, and dust reduces visibility. The rainy season is from November to March. Water erodes the clayish surface, making it slippery and unstable. Some places are difficult for even one car to pass, and virtually impossible for two. There are no guardrails or deceleration lanes. That's why cars stop, drivers get out, and agree how to pass one another. However, not only cars, but also bicyclists are at risk here. Even excursions are dangerous. At least 18 tourists have died here since 1998. This path has been officially recognized as the most dangerous in the world. An average of 26 buses and cars have fallen here each year, killing dozens and even hundreds of people. The most terrible case occurred in 1983. Residents of La Paz were returning home after the holiday in Coroico. There were many of them, and the driver boarded the bus with twice as many passengers as it was supposed to carry. As a result, the vehicle tilted on a narrow curve and fell off a cliff. The road of death then took 100 lives. It is also creepy to drive on this road because there are crosses at every turn in memory of the dead. Bolivians call them warning signs. The breaking point was in 2007 when an alternative road, a modern, safe highway, was opened between La Paz and Coroico. Now, the old one is hardly used for its intended purpose. It has become a tourist attraction and a source of adrenaline. But let's leave this dangerous road and move to another risky elevation. It looks like a modest peak in the northeastern United States but it has actually claimed more lives than any other mountain in the country. That's 160 people since record-keeping began in 1849. Native Americans call it the home of the Great Spirit. So why is Mount Washington so dangerous? To begin with, it is far from being the highest mountain in the U.S. Its height is only 1,917 meters, 6,288 feet. Nevertheless, it is popular among tourists. It is visited by up to 250,000 people a year. This is in spite of the extremely unfavorable weather on it, which is often called the worst weather in the world. In 1934, the observatory registered a record wind speed of 372 kilometers per hour, 231 miles per hour. That's faster than high-speed trains, Nowadays, hurricane winds blow on the mountain roughly every four days. Another factor is the low temperatures. It often reaches minus 45.6 degrees Celsius, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the summit. Therefore, tourists often get hypothermia and frostbite. In addition to winds, there is abundant precipitation. The mountain gets 711 centimeters, 280 inches of snow annually. It can cover the trails even in July. Rain and fog are also common occurrences here. You wouldn't be able to see your own feet or an outstretched arm in such weather. The matter is complicated by the fact that even with terrible weather at the top, it can be warm and sunny at the foot of the mountain. So unprepared tourists dare to hike. They end up getting tired and exhausted very quickly, staying dehydrated and stressed out in the ever-changing weather conditions. So the next danger after weather is being unprepared for hiking. And proximity to urban centers doesn't help here. For example, you may well wake up in Boston at 5 a.m. and drive to Mount Washington for a day hike instead of serious preparation. And that would be unwise. In the case of Mount Washington, Preparation means not only training for better physical fitness and layered clothing, but 
also being prepared to abandon plans and return earlier than planned if the weather turns bad. But while the mountain, despite the winds, can be visited, you can only get to the last place in our top 15 with us. However, it is better not to go there at all. Every year, snakes kill thousands of people around the world, but the average person rarely crosses paths with snakes. However, there is a place in the world that is literally teeming with them. This is the island called Ilha da Quimada Grande, 20 miles from Sao Paulo in southeastern Brazil, or Snake Island. It is believed that 400,000 snakes lived there in the past. People thought there was one snake for every square meter, but this is most likely a myth. In fact, such a large number of reptiles can't feed themselves in such a small area. There are now no more than 4,000 to 5,000 snakes on the island, but it's still best not to go there, although the Brazilian government has already closed access to it. Most of the inhabitants of the island, about 2,400 to 2,900 specimens, are golden lancehead viper. It is only found there. This reptile is a close relative of the Ferdi Lance, one of the deadliest snakes in the Americas. The death rate from golden lancehead viper's venom is 7%. This figure is not the highest, but you would hardly want to try your luck in this way. By the way, there are no recent cases of lethal outcomes thanks to the prohibition of the authorities to visit the island. Thanks to the prohibition of the authorities to visit the island. Still, if a person is bitten by a golden lancehead viper, he or she will suffer severe pain, internal bleeding, necrosis of muscle tissue, risk of cerebral hemorrhage, and possibly death if help is not provided in time. No wonder people wanted to get rid of such a neighborhood. So, in the beginning of the 20th century, they tried to clear the territory on the island for banana plantations, burning the forest but the snakes literally stood up in defense of their home. They attacked the workers, and eventually, the people retreated. Once upon a time, according to the most popular theory, it was humans who evicted the snakes to Ilha da Quimara Grande. This happened 9,000 to 11,000 years ago, after the last ice age. Back then, the island was connected to the mainland by a narrow neck of land. It's along this neck of land that the snakes retreated from the advancing humans. Then this neck of land became submerged, and the snakes remained on Ilha da Quimara Grande. But there is another version, which is appreciated by fans of fairy tales. According to it, pirates buried treasures on the island. To protect them, they inhabited it with venomous snakes, which eventually multiplied greatly. Another legend dates back to the early 20th century and concerns the former keeper of the lighthouse, which now works automatically, and his family. It is said that the snakes set off a massive attack on them. The reptiles got into the bedroom through the windows and started biting people. People fled into the forest, where they died after being attacked by hundreds of snakes. But there is no confirmation of all these stories and it should be noted that the population of snakes on the island has decreased significantly due to lack of food. At first, they multiplied by simply eating all the small animals in the area, and then the food became scarce. The species is now in the Red Book and is protected because it is endemic. It does not live anywhere else but on this island. There are many dangerous places in the world where people face various threats. However, they can be mesmerizingly beautiful, which only makes them even more dangerous. What do you picture when you hear the word lake? Bathing in clean water and having a great vacation? There are lakes, one drop from which can cost you your health or even your life. Lakes can be silent killers, suffocating with accumulated gases, become a haven for incredible creatures, and can even explode. The deepest lake in the world is Lake Baikal in Russia, with a depth of over 1,600 meters, 5,249 feet. It is also the oldest lake in the world, with an age of about 25 million years. 
Canada is home to over 31,000 lakes with an area exceeding three square kilometers, 1.16 square miles, making it the country with the largest number of major lakes on Earth. Lakes contribute to the diversity of life. Many species of plants and animals depend on lakes for survival. Lakes are important ecosystems that support biodiversity. Many cities and communities around the world depend on lakes as sources of potable water. The world's most eerie lakes. The red waters of Lake Natron on the border of Tanzania and Kenya bring to mind alien landscapes, but it's better known as the Lake of Death. It's because of its composition. Its water has a high alkaline content with a pH of nine to 12, while the allowable value for humans is almost two times lower. That is, it is a huge natural tub with a mixture of calcium and sodium salts, similar in composition to laundry detergent. These substances are contained in the lava of the volcano Old Doño Lingai, oozing from the mountain. This cocktail will dissolve the ink on printed matter. It's also deadly to birds and animals. The lake is avoided by lizards, snakes, and even hyenas, which are not so easy to scare. So the natron area is free of animals that hunt. Another deadly factor is its temperature. The lake is only three meters, 9.8 feet deep. So it warms up to 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, 122 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit during dry periods. Do you still find these waters beautiful? Then let's recount the story of English photographer, Nick Brandt. One day, he was walking along Lake Natron and noticed the fossilized remains of a pigeon, an eagle, and a lesser flamingo at the bottom. The birds had fallen into the water and could no longer escape its embrace, turning into lime statues. They were killed by a lethal dose of lye, and then they calcified, that is, turned into limestone. During dry weather, the lake shallowed, and the feathered creatures remained on the cracked bottom where Brent found them. The photographer collected the remains and arranged them in natural poses against the background of the water. These images spread around the world, making Natron famous. But why do birds even come near this lake? It's still not known exactly what makes them land on the water. It's thought to be because of its reflective power. The birds can't see the lake below and crash into it. But this hypothesis has not been confirmed. Amazingly, there is life in this deadly lake. In the water and on its surface, there is a small alkaline tilapia, as well as several species of bacteria and protozoan algae. The lake owes its fantastic red-orange color to the latter. The algae, in turn, are eaten by lesser flamingos. There are a huge number of them on the lake. But how can it be? Why don't the deadly waters have any effect on them? Actually, they do. But the flamingos choose a special time of year for their visit. From February to April, Natron is replenished by rainwater. Plus, a river of clean, safe water flows into the lake. As a result, the concentration of hazardous substances in it is reduced. So the lesser flamingos not only live on the lake, but even lay eggs. That's why Natron is also called the Flamingo Factory. In these waters, 75% of all lesser pink flamingos in the world hatch. Imagine these beautiful birds standing in hot water and feeding on poisonous algae. The birds dip their beaks directly into the lake and filter their food out of the water. They don't get burned thanks to the tough skin and scales on their feet. By the way, flamingos can also drink salt water. We bet you won't be able to look at these birds the same way after this. And flamingos turn pink precisely because of the algae they eat although initially they are born white or gray. That's because this food contains the pigment carotenoid. It's just like if your skin would turn red from eating beets. This is why tourists come to Natron, to admire the pink birds against the background of scarlet waters and sunset. When the dry season comes and the lake shrinks and the river that fills it dries up, 
Natron turns into a salt trap, but the flamingos are unaffected. By then, they'll have moved on to more pleasant places. But what happens if you fall into Natron? According to the experts, you won't turn to stone. But if you have cuts or scratches on your body, they will burn like hell, as will your eyes, and your skin will blister because of the corrosive environment. The next lake is several times more dangerous than Chernobyl. This is Karache, located in Russia, formerly the most polluted water body on Earth and you wouldn't endure even five minutes near this place. Why former? Because it's now buried and mothballed. But first things first, this story begins on August 6, 1945, at a distance of 6,000 kilometers, 3,728 miles from Lake Karache. On that day, the Americans dropped the atomic bomb Little Boy on the Japanese city of Hiroshima and a nuclear arms race began. Looking ahead, I shall say that it had unforeseen consequences for the Russians. In November 1945, almost 2,000 kilometers, 1,242 miles from Moscow, they began building the USSR's first chemical plant to produce nuclear weapons components. Over the next three years, according to participants of the events, 70,000 prisoners built a secret facility the Mayak Production Association's seven nuclear reactors. Next to it grew an equally secret city of nuclear scientists, workers, and their families called Chelyabinsk 40. We bet you wouldn't want to live in such a place. Just imagine what it's like behind barbed wire, and you can't leave the territory without a special permit. The residents of the town were forbidden even to write letters. The first reactor of Mayak PA was launched in June 1948, and there was no normal waste disposal. It was dumped into the Techa River until the maximum permissible dose of harmful substances was exceeded by 3.5 times. And this is not like leaving a bag of garbage near a container. To solve this problem, it was decided to dump liquid radioactive waste into Lake Karachay in 1951. During the time when the lake was used as a dump, it accumulated 150 million curies of long-lived nuclear waste. This exceeds the radiation waste from Chernobyl six times. But Karache became a mistake for scientists. The lake constantly dried up and dangerous radioactive dust formed on the bare shores. According to calculations, if a tornado had occurred when the lake was drying up, up to 20,000 people could have died from radiation damage. However, it is not necessary to wait for a tornado. It is enough to stand next to such a source for 15 minutes to get an enormous dose of radioactive exposure of 600 roentgens. It probably won't be lethal, but your life will never be the same. And if you stay an hour longer, you definitely won't be alive. This creepy place quickly grew rumors, which in conditions of total secrecy became even more terrible details. Thus, it was said that fish from Karache resembled heroes of horror movies. Carp shone like lanterns, and Crucian carps had neither eyes nor tail, and their scales grew not towards the tail, but towards the head. On September 29th, 1957, a technogenic disaster occurred in the history of Karache. The cooling system at Mayak PA was disturbed, as a result of which a stainless steel tank with 70 to 80 tons of nuclear waste exploded. The radioactive cloud rose to a height of 2 kilometers, 1.2 miles, and covered several regions of Russia. And locals saw something similar to the Northern Lights. Do you think beauty can't be deadly? In fact, it was a cloud of radioactive dust and smoke that shimmered with different colors. In the end, 217 communities where 272,000 people lived were contaminated. This accident ranks third in the world in terms of environmental damage. 
the concentration of radiation in the lake exceeded all imaginable limits. And in 1967, strong winds lifted tons of radioactive materials from the shores. 41,500 people in 63 settlements were affected. The secret of Lake Karache came out and the management of the Mayak PA decided to raise the shores along the entire perimeter of the reservoir. The surface of the lake became smaller. For the next four years, the water level in Karache was under close observation. And then it went up sharply, and it was decided to completely backfill the lake. It was started only in 1986, after the infamous Chernobyl accident. And in 1988, the lake began to be covered with rock slabs. The last elements were installed in 2015. This is when the mothballing ended. It cost Russia about $174 million, and the lake will only require another $2 million to be maintained. The mothballed reservoir is believed to be safe. The rock cover prevents radiation from leaking out. The surface is planned to be planted with shrubs and grass, but not trees. Their roots would weaken the rock. However, in theory, the lake's underground water could reach other reservoirs, and then the radioactive substances would travel with them. The consequences would be terrible. The soil, drinking water sources, and reservoirs of nearby cities would be poisoned. So this lake is not to be messed with. What could a volcano and a lake have in common? No, it's not the temperature, and it's not the bull shape. It's the serial killer potential. Lake of a Thousand Deaths, Nios, is located in the crater of a volcano in Cameroon, near the border with Nigeria. It has a small area, 1.6 square kilometers, 0.6 square miles, and an impressive depth of 209 meters, 686 feet which is almost the size of a 70-story house. The lake was formed on this spot 400 years ago, and for a long time, nothing foreshadowed disaster. No one knew that deadly gas was accumulating beneath these quiet waters. The fact is that the volcano was extinct only on the surface and continued to form large amounts of carbon dioxide, CO2, from igneous rock under Lake Nyos. It met the groundwater, dissolved in it, and so entered the reservoir. As a result, over one cubic kilometer of carbon dioxide accumulated in the bottom layers. If this volume were filled with drinking water, it would be enough for 40 days for all mankind, provided that everyone would drink three liters a day. So the poisonous gas accumulated at depth and for some reason did not mix with the upper layers. We can guess the reason though. If it was cool in Cameroon, the water on the surface of the lake would cool and lower, and warm water from the depths would come up instead. Then carbon dioxide would rise from the bottom and dissipate into the atmosphere before reaching dangerous concentrations. But it's always hot in Cameroon, so there is no such movement in the Nios. The water doesn't cool down and doesn't mix. Simply put, there was a bomb growing at the bottom of the lake for thousands of years until it exploded on August 21st, 1986. What disturbed the fragile balance? It is believed that part of the berm surrounding the reservoir collapsed. A 25 meter, 82 foot tsunami rose and the layers of Lake Nyos got mixed up. As a result, huge amounts of poisonous gas escaped into the atmosphere. These kinds of events are called limnological disasters. I couldn't speak. I couldn't even open my mouth. I went to my daughter's bed, thinking she was sleeping, but she was already dead. It was only the next day that I had the strength to leave the house. All my neighbors were also dead. This is how one of the few witnesses of the disaster who managed to survive describes the aftermath. Just imagine, in a matter of minutes, 1,746 people and over 3,500 livestock were killed by carbon dioxide from Lake Nyos. 
about 1,000 more people sought medical attention. Notably, some villages were located within 25 kilometers, 15.5 miles from the source of the disaster. Not even the birds and insects around Nios could survive, and the grass turned black and shriveled. Scientists estimate that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air exceeded 30%, while the normal value is 0.04%. It was near the surface of the ground that the gas spread because it is heavier than air. The result, people lost consciousness and died of asphyxiation. The rescuers who arrived had almost no one to save. Interestingly, the few survivors claimed to have smelled rotten eggs and heard a powerful explosion at the time of the disaster. This could have happened in an explosive-type volcanic eruption, but the samples taken did not confirm it, and the source of the unpleasant odor, apparently, was hydrogen sulfide, which was contained in the bottom layers of the lake together with carbon dioxide and other gases. There was another mystery. Residents of the village 10 kilometers from the lake claimed that they felt the bad smell and heard the explosion at the same time, although the gas needed half an hour to pass this distance, while the sound covered it in only 32 seconds. A remarkable fact is that immediately after the tragedy, the lake became red-brown in color due to oxidization. Do you think that was the end of it? Well, it's not. The killer lake is not dozing, and the gas continues to accumulate in the bottom layers. About 5 million cubic meters, 176.6 million cubic feet per year. That is 185 million cubic meters. 6,533,000,000 million cubic feet have already accumulated since the disaster. And this means that the reservoir can deliver another powerful pop so you have to be extremely careful near this lake. However, the authorities have not let the things rip. They are carrying out degassing and other similar measures to keep people safe. Legends say that just one drop of water from the following Italian water body can cause a severe burn. It's all about the killing chemical composition of the Lake of Death in southern Sicily. It's fed by two underground springs with sulfuric acid. So there is no wonder that not even microorganisms can survive in it. The water is completely lifeless. Moreover, because of the lake's vapors, nothing grows around it within a radius of one kilometer, 0.6 miles and the nearest forest is five kilometers, three miles away. Birds that choose to land on the shore of the Lake of Death die. But here's a strange fact. With such extraordinary properties, the lake is little known in its homeland. Most Sicilians have never heard of this relentless killer. However, it is rumored that the Sicilian mafia was well aware of this dead lake. According to legends on the internet, the Mafia thugs used it to dispose of the corpses of their enemies and even execute the ones out of favor. After all, the waters of the lake dissolve the body in a matter of hours, and some even claim that it takes minutes. So there are hundreds of unlucky souls who have found their final resting place at the bottom of the lake. In other words, this reservoir phenomenon is regularly on the list of the most terrible places on Earth despite all its beauty. It also has one major drawback. It doesn't exist. The Lake of Death in Sicily is a popularized myth. In fact, there are thermal lakes of Yellowstone National Park in the United States that are often shown on the photos claimed as photos of this lake. On them, we see deep turquoise water with red-orange shores. It is one of the most mesmerizing views. Sometimes the photos are mirrored, but what unites all these photos is the yelling color of the water, which immediately confirms the terrible reputation of this place. At different times, such Yellowstone lakes as Chromatic Pool, Grand Prismatic Spring, Morning Glory Pool, and Emerald Pool 
were disguised as this acidic reservoir. But is there a prototype? Or is it all just one big hoax, you may ask? Yes, there is. It is the Sicilian lake Lago Naftia. It was studied by volcanologists Gattano Ponte at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, and he took a lot of photos. He found out that the waters of Lago Naftia were bubbling because of abundant carbon dioxide emissions, not because of sulfuric acid. The lake was of modest size, only 146 meters, 480 feet in circumference, and no more than five meters, 16 feet deep. By 1908, it had begun to shallow. However, by 1935, the water level may have risen again. But most interestingly, there are no modern photos of the Lake of Death, except those of Yellowstone. The thing is that it was drained in the second half of the 20th century, and a gas production facility was erected in its place. What do you think of our small investigation? Parents do not let their children bathe in this lake and warn tourists. It has a really bad reputation of being cursed. But why? There are many reasons, and most of them are overgrown with legends. Locals believe that it all started about 100 years ago, when a man went mad with jealousy for his bride and drowned her in the lake. Eventually, the lake became uninhabited, and inexplicable phenomena started to occur there. Even if you do not believe in them, you'd better not go into the dead lake because it conceals real dangers. In this respect, the elder of a nearby village was lucky. He went swimming in the lake as a boy, despite the prohibitions of adults, and this, of course, did not go without a trace. Feel what was happening to him. As soon as you step into the water, it becomes difficult to breathe and to move your legs and arms. Then a fog wraps your mind and you sink into darkness. The boy woke up near the lake. His hands were torn into blood and his body was aching. But the most interesting thing came out when he finally reached the village. The swimmer was missing for two weeks and everyone already thought he was dead. At least, that's what he claims. The locals say there are many people who have experienced the same things as the future elder. They've all disappeared near the lake and then suddenly reappeared. But it was impossible to find out what happened to them because they all lost their memory for that period. But let's move away from legends and try to explain these terrible stories from a scientific point of view. First, it is believed that the water body is toxic and unable to support life. That's why there are no fish and insects here. The only inhabitants of the dead lake in Kazakhstan are green algae and purple bacteria at the bottom. That's where its name comes from. Hydrologist Iskander Tursanov notes that mercury mines were once located near the lake. Some of the hazardous waste from them may have gotten into the lake through underground springs. As a result, a lot of hydrogen sulfide has formed in the lake, which kills fish. Secondly, the lake never dries up, and the water always stays cool, even in hot weather. One could see mysticism here, but in fact, scientists explain this mystery by the fact that the lake was formed as a result of the activity of ancient glaciers and lies in the funnel of glacial deposits. Third, the lake is known to be 100 meters, 328 feet long, and 60 meters, 197 feet wide. But no one has been able to measure its depth, so it remains unrecorded. Rumor has it that divers are starting to feel unwell because of the physical properties of the water, and no measurements have been taken in any other way. Fourth, it owes part of its notoriety to drowned people. According to locals, almost every year, dozens of people drown in the lake and disappear without a trace. The creepiest thing is that they do not rise to the surface, but remain standing on the bottom. Just imagine this forest of human bodies. However, 
This is also likely a myth, as some of the interviewed locals have never heard of real cases of drowning on the lake. Finally, fifthly, the lake is so salty that only the above-mentioned algae and purple bacteria, which produce hydrogen sulfide, can live in it. And this substance with a typical odor causes disorders in people, even in small doses. Having inhaled it, a person can lose his mind for a while and see hallucinations. This may be the explanation of all the strange things that happened on the lake. And we move on to a body of water in the Caribbean. Just giving you a heads up, guys. Don't even think about dipping your hand into this lake. Its water temperature reaches 82 to 92 degrees Celsius, 180 to 198 degrees Fahrenheit. Just so you know, that's how the Boiling Lake earned its name. This natural wonder lies in the Mourne Pateau National Park in the Caribbean nation of Dominica, on the slope of the Mourne Watt volcano. This region is known for its high volcanic activity. The park covers an area of 7,000 hectares, 27 square miles. In addition to Boiling Lake, it has five of the island's nine volcanoes and dozens of hot springs and fumaroles. That is, cracks or holes in the Earth's crust that can connect to subterranean magma. This lake is just a flooded volcanic fumarole which is why jets of hot air and even lava can blow underwater. Naturally, swimming here is not a good idea unless you want to be boiled alive. But if you are a daring soul, you could replicate the feat of American director George Karunas. In 2007, he became the first person ever to cross the lake on a rope above it. This moment was filmed for the Angry Planet TV series. The most crucial thing here is timing, because the fumarole activity varies during different periods. For example, in 2006, gas emissions were minimal, but in early 2009, the lake was boiling like mad. The water in the lake is grayish blue. Its color is attributed to dissolved materials and gases. Normally, it is heated up by hot steam and gases, which make the lake a fascinating sight to behold with clouds of steam hanging above it. Measuring approximately 60 by 75 meters, 197 by 246 feet, it ranks as the world's second largest hot lake after Frying Pan Lake in New Zealand. The Boiling Lake was discovered back in 1870 by two Englishmen, Edmund Watt and Henry Nichols. At that time, they were working in Dominica and exploring this unique place. They measured the water's temperature, but only at the edges, because it was too dangerous to reach the center. They also measured its depth, which turned out to be 60 meters, 197 feet. However, this figure is debatable. Today, the lake is believed to be only 15 meters, 49 feet deep. But this is where volcanic activity comes into play. You know about the complex origins of the lake, right? Given the magmatic activity, the initial depth might indeed have been 60 meters, 197 feet. But a century later, it appears to have decreased by nearly four times. Yet, these aren't the only mysteries the lake beholds. One day in 1980, it almost vanished. An eruption led to a geyser of hot water and steam and almost dried it up. Then the lake gradually refilled. A quarter of a century later, in 2004, another eruption caused the water level in Boiling Lake to drop by 10 meters. This persisted for five months, but astonishingly, the lake was replenished in just a single day. If you want to see the lake with your own eyes, you will have to work hard to get there. It's situated 13 kilometers uphill from the closest road. Furthermore, along the way, you'd have to encounter sulfur springs and hot pools. We don't advise taking this journey without a guide. Legend has it that those who approached Lake Brosno with evil thoughts were devoured by a merciless monster. Emerging from the watery depths, 
it would open its huge mouth. The fairy tale says that this monster's first victim was the Scandinavian leader who sought to transport the stolen goods to the other side of the lake. Then a monster rose from the depths, destroyed the boat, and devoured everyone who was on it. The Mongol Khan met a similar fate, swallowed whole along with his boat. A more recent legend from the 20th century claims that during World War II, a German plane plummeted into the lake but was never found. Since then, Lake Brosno has become a source of dread. Some stories reinforce this dread even today. Would you risk swimming across this water body after everything you now know? Do you see these stories as mere fairy tales from the past? Yet, there is some evidence to this day. In 1992, a resident of one of the nearby villages noticed a creature that resembled an ancient dinosaur, about 5 meters, 16.4 feet long, basking on the coastal sand. In 2001, rumors had it that the monster claimed the life of a young girl right in front of her parents. Little did we know, there was more to come. One fateful day, a boat with the bodies of several young people washed ashore. The faces of all three were distorted in horror. It was the same horror that seized the local residents, who eventually decided to vacate the area around Brosno. Of the numerous villages, only a handful remain. Drawing parallels with the Loch Ness Monster, aka Nessie, this creature was dubbed Brosnia. The mounting tales tested the patience of scientists who decided once and for all to tell the truth from fiction. The first thing they found out was that the rumors about Brosnia benefited a certain businessman who was going to build a guest house on the shore of the lake. New details of the legend would attract more tourists to this place, ensuring a high revenue. Secondly, they found that the surrounding villages left their homes not because of the monster, but because of poverty. Yet, tales of the monster date back to ancient times, long before opportunistic entrepreneurs were around. Then, scientists began to explore the water body and determined that its depth would not support such a large creature. While 43 meters, 141 feet, might seem deep for a lake, it's insufficient for a massive ancient predator. In addition, it simply wouldn't have enough food. But the lake itself seemed to challenge the scientists' argument. One day, its waters began to boil, as if preparing to unleash the legendary beast. Undeterred, the scientists released a firecracker into the bubbling mass. While they never encountered the monster, they did detect a potent scent of hydrogen sulfide. From that point, the monster was debunked. It turned out to be accumulations of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The culprit was the decomposition process triggered by plants and trees falling into the lake. When the water pressure acted on these gases, they were released. Any abrupt disturbance over a hydrate cushion, like casting an anchor for example, could trigger such an eruption and from the shore, the resulting crater looked like the open mouth of a monster. Add to this fact that these gases seriously affect a person's well-being and can induce hallucinations. It's easy to see how bubbles and foam might be misconstrued as signs of a lurking beast in this state. By the way, even the bottom topography remains a mystery. The exact depth of the lake is unknown. Due to crevices and depressions, it may not be 43 meters, 141 feet, but as many as 60 meters, 197 feet. Add to this the thick sediment layer, which in some places exceeds 5 meters, 16.4 feet. Therefore, you cannot know for sure who lives at the bottom, but we definitely don't recommend swimming in this lake or walking next to it. What's the one thing you don't want to catch in a lake? A piece of trash? A predatory fish? A rat? We bet you wouldn't like one fisherman's catch off the south shore of Lake Tahoe on the California-Nevada border in the US. 
Rumor has it that a few years ago, he reeled in a well-preserved human ear, although someone claims that it was a three-fingered hand. But how did this eerie find end up there? And what other mysteries does this body of water hold? Let's figure this out. Lake Tahoe is the second deepest in the United States and the 17th deepest in the world. It is 501 meters, 1,643 feet deep. The lake stretches 35 kilometers, 21.7 miles in length, and spans 19 kilometers, 11.8 miles in width. Originally, the Washoe people, a Great Basin tribe of Native Americans, lived around the lake. They named this place Daoaga, which translates to edge of the lake. With the arrival of white explorers, only the first part of this name persisted, Dao, which evolved into Tahoe. In the native Indian language, this term means grasshopper soup. So, how did a human body part end up in its waters? Local lore suggests that between the 1920s and 1950s, the Mafia used the South Shore as a dumping ground for their victims. This tale reminds us of our favorite mythical lake in Sicily, doesn't it? If you were to believe this legend, the lake's depths would be littered with hundreds of corpses, preserved by the cold water temperatures. But is this story pure fiction? Many fishermen refer to this spot as the cemetery. And the second installment of The Godfather depicts the Mafia's execution on a boat. Now let's take a closer look at that place in the lake. Can't you see anything? Perhaps Tessie is lurking there right now. The local aquatic creature was named by analogy with the Loch Ness Monster, otherwise known as Nessie. Of course, just like in the case of the Scottish folklore character, its existence hasn't been scientifically proven. The beast was first mentioned in Native American legends and was later reported by white settlers in the 19th century. Tessie made headlines these days in the San Francisco Chronicle in 1984. Then he was allegedly seen by two residents of Tahoe City, Patsy McKay and Diane Stavarakis. They were walking above the western shore when they noticed an incredible creature in the lake. McKay claimed the beast was about 5.1 meters, 17 feet long. She watched it closely and saw it surface like a small submarine three times. According to her companion, the creature had a humped back and was moving like a whale. McKay was firmly convinced that it wasn't a diver, a log, or a large ripple. Two years earlier, two police officers claimed to have encountered Tessie. Officers Chris Beebe and Jerry Jones were off duty when an unusually large creature swam past them. But the mysteries of the lake don't end there. It is believed that an underground river system connects Tahoe to Pyramid Lake in Nevada. This is evidenced by the bodies of people who drowned in Tahoe resurfacing in Pyramid Lake, 80 kilometers, 50 miles to the north. Even the famous oceanographer Jacques Cousteau tried to unravel the secrets of the lake in the mid-1970s. After several dives, he allegedly uttered the famous phrase, the world isn't ready for what is down there. Whether he really said this or not remains a mystery, but one thing is clear, you need to be extremely careful in this lake. The next lake became famous thanks to its inhabitants, who resemble some weird sci-fi creatures. Here's how the story goes. On a bright morning, Eric Osinski set out for a fishing trip, unaware that his day would soon make headlines. His son tagged along with him. They were going to catch trout in a stream that flows into Lake Champlain on the United States-Canada border. The fishermen arrived at the spot, prepared their gear, and quietly settled in. Before long, they had a bite. They managed to catch two trout. This was one of those exciting moments that could make your hands shake. Unfortunately for Eric, while he was adjusting the net, one fish slipped away and the other snapped the line. The fishing didn't start the way he and his son planned, but their luck seemed to turn when they felt another tug on their lines. 
Osinski looked at the catch and recoiled in horror. What they caught was a far cry from trout. In fact, the creature resembled the Sarlacc monster from Star Wars, or a hybrid of a snake and a leech. It had a slippery body which was extra hard to hold, and a funnel-shaped mouth full of sharp teeth. It was about 60 centimeters or 24 inches long. The very touch of this alien-like creature repulsed Osinski, but he still picked it up and took a photograph. He later published the photo on social media and received hundreds of comments. Only then did he learn he had caught a lamprey. A lot of people wrote about their impressions in the comments. One of the commenters said, I didn't even think that you could catch such a monster with a fishing rod. Others mentioned the fact that these creatures harm the ecosystem. Osinski didn't take the catch with him. After taking a picture of the lamprey, he released it into the lake. Lampreys are often called sucker fish, but in fact, they are external parasites of large fish. They belong to the jawless class of animals and predate most fish, which is why they are also called prehistoric vampires. Distinct from most fish, lampreys have cartilaginous bodies and lack scales or fins, making them very difficult to hold. They possess seven gill openings on each side of the body, earning them a cool nickname, flutes. These creatures thrive in the vast Lake Champlain, which spans 172 kilometers in length and reaches 120 meters deep. Lampreys swim in search of prey, latch onto them with their funnel-shaped mouths, and feed on the fish's blood. They can be as small as 10 centimeters, 3.9 inches long, or up to a meter, 3.3 feet long. Such lampreys pose a threat even to large salmon. Lampreys weren't documented in Lake Champlain until 1929. Whether they've always inhabited the lake or were introduced by humans remains a mystery. According to recent research, lampreys could have lived in the lake as early as 10,000 years ago. They are the only drawback of freshwater Champlain, which has no dangerous currents and a normal chemical composition. Lampreys have caused a massive decline in the local fish population which is why authorities took measure to manage these toothy creatures. To control their population, the authorities used chemicals that lampreys couldn't process, unlike other animals living in the lake. Over time, they hope to completely eradicate lampreys. For now, swimmers are wary of Lake Champlain's depths, named after the French explorer Samuel de Champlain. While scientists generally dismiss the idea of lampreys attacking humans, a 2018 report of a diver's encounter with one caught the attention of freshwater detective and biologist Jeremy Wade. He couldn't confirm any lamprey attacks on humans, but managed to track several large individuals and was even bitten by one of them. So it's better to stay clear of these waters. Take a look at this lake. It looks calm, doesn't it? Yet, it poses a significant threat to two million people. So why is it dangerous? Lake Kivu lies in the heart of Africa. Its western part is located in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the eastern part is in Rwanda. Kivu is part of the African Great Lake system. These lakes are notably deep because of the large tectonic faults in the Earth's crust that run through the entire African continent. At its deepest, Kivu reaches 480 meters, 1,575 feet, ranking it the 10th deepest lake in the world. Geologically, this region has its challenges. Firstly, the fault housing the lake is constantly expanding and deepening. Secondly, there are several volcanoes nearby, which sometimes make their presence felt. Both of these factors led to the accumulation of carbon dioxide at the bottom of the lake, which comes from the Earth's core. It is partially transformed into methane, thanks to bacteria living in the water column. This gas also accumulates on the lake bed. Another unique feature of this lake is its minimal evaporation rate. Due to high air humidity, 
and constant high temperatures. Because of this, there is a layer of water vapor above the lake's surface which interferes with evaporation. Considering the lake's immense depth combined with its limited evaporation, it becomes clear that the water masses are largely stagnant. As a result, gases don't dissipate gradually, but accumulate over time. It's impossible to say the exact volume of gases at the bottom of Kivu, but this is definitely the largest value among all the lakes on the planet. That is, the lake behaves like an unopened soda. CO2 remains dissolved in the water. In both the lake and a soda can, carbon dioxide dissolves faster under high pressure and in cold conditions. Therefore, soda bubbles only appear when someone opens the can and CO2 is released. But let's go a step back and remember that the pressure at the bottom of the lake is higher than at the surface. Given Lake Kivu's depth, the pressure at its base where vast amounts of CO2 have accumulated is extremely high, which makes it very unstable. All it takes is some kind of shock, say a volcano eruption or an earthquake for the lake to explode. Such an event would force the CO2 rich water into the upper, less pressurized layers of the lake that can no longer hold it. As a result, bubbles would surface followed by a rising column of gas, culminating in an explosion. So imagine that Lake Kivu is a giant soda can that you can shake and then open. In other words, this lake faces the threat of a limnological eruption similar to the one that occurred on Lake Nyos. However, there's a crucial distinction. Kivu is vastly larger than Lake Nyos, and contains a significantly greater volume of gas, 65 cubic kilometers, 15.6 cubic miles of methane, and 256 cubic kilometers, 61.4 cubic miles of CO2. Yet, there are lots of resorts and hotels on its shores. Moreover, geologists have found evidence that Kivu erupts every 1,000 years, destroying a significant part of the local wildlife. Interestingly, an explosion isn't the only potential hazard. Instead, the accumulated gas may come out and poison everyone in the vicinity. What efforts do we make to address this problem? Authorities are extracting dangerous gases. For instance, the Rwandan government has established a power plant on its part of the lake, which harnesses energy by burning the gas mixture from the bottom of Kivu. They plan to build another power plant. Let's hope it makes this dangerous place a little safer. From time immemorial, lakes have attracted people. But what about the oceans? The ocean once became the cradle of life on our planet. We live thanks to it, but it can just as easily take this life away. Indeed, the ocean can often be treacherous, and some places are more dangerous than others. Now you will find out which US beach is so dangerous that once you go into the water, you are bound to be a couple of feet away from a shark without even knowing it. Where is the most dangerous diving site in the world? And why did the Cape of Good Hope deprive thousands of sailors even of the last thread of hope? Top 10 Most Dangerous Places of the World Ocean Let's dive down into probably the most dangerous dive site in the world. It's also known as the Diver's Cemetery and you're about to find out where such an ominous name came from. Off the coast of Egypt, eight kilometers, five miles north of the city of Dahab, there is an underwater vertical cave going more than 100 meters, 328 feet into the depths of the Red Sea. It is not just a deep hole, but a karst cave with a unique structure. It starts with a shallow opening to the sea about six meters, 20 feet deep. It is called the saddle. Then there is a 26 meter, 85 foot long tunnel known as the arch. Its ceiling lies much deeper, 55 meters, 181 feet below the surface. 
The bottom of the cave then lowers as it moves away from the shore towards the open sea to a depth of about 120 meters, 394 feet. The hole itself and its surroundings are teeming with gorgeous corals and no less beautiful reef fish. In addition, there is an easy way to enter the water, no waves on the surface and no currents under the water. It would seem to be an ideal place for diving. Why is it called the Diver's Cemetery? There are no journalistic tricks here. Many divers really died in this place. Data varies. Some sources claim 130 deaths between 1997 and 2012, while others give gloomier figures, up to 200 victims. Memorial plaques installed on the shore are an eloquent reminder that this is not a myth or an urban legend there is someone's name written on each plaque. There is still no consensus on what makes the Blue Hole of the Red Sea the deadliest diving site on Earth. Its geological structure is not that complicated. Some believe that this is what has played a cruel joke on many divers. Less experienced divers could have simply underestimated the treachery of this place. The second point is the fact that this place is popular not only among scuba divers, but also among free divers, breath hold divers, just because of the lack of waves and underwater currents. And free diving is obviously much more dangerous than scuba diving. Combined, all these factors have created this ominous statistic. But the Blue Hole, even despite its reputation, continues to attract many adventurous thrill-seekers who dive into its depths almost daily. So while some try to stay away from the Blue Hole, others still want to pass through the tunnel that has led to so many deaths. The bodies of dead divers sometimes remain lying in this rocky trap for a long time. And some of these creepy scenes can even be captured by other, more fortunate divers. A young Russian-Israeli diving instructor, Yuri Lipsky, in 2000, filmed his own death in the Blue Hole with a helmet camera. We will come back to this story a little later as it contains some important details. But first, let's talk about some things for a better understanding. A place that gathers so many victims could not do without legends of various degrees of plausibility. The Blue Hole got its legend about a curse. And it arose, according to the legend, after a woman who couldn't bear a marriage of convenience with a man she didn't love decided to drown herself in the hole. The typical, albeit naive, story was wandering in the mines until a 53-year-old technical diver from Dahab, Tarek Omar, became interested in it. He began exploring the Blue Hole in 1992 and quickly discovered the bodies of dead divers. He became really famous in 1997 when he brought the first two bodies to the surface. Since then, he says he has taken more than 20 bodies out of the water, for which he earned the grim nickname, the Bone Collector. So it was Tarek Omar who recovered the body of 22-year-old Yuri Lipsky, a man who filmed his own death in this ominous place. The heartbreaking footage is still available on YouTube and makes the blood run cold in the veins of viewers. In the video, Lipsky makes an involuntary and uncontrolled descent, eventually landing on the seafloor at a depth of 115 meters. There, he panics, removes his regulator, and tries to fill his buoyancy compensator, but is unable to rise. At such a depth, with such a high rate of diving, he was most likely overtaken by what is known as nitrogen narcosis. The poor diver probably experienced mental fog and even hallucinations, in addition to the obvious panic and confusion. This footage made Lipsky's death the most notorious diver death at this site, and one of the most notorious diver deaths in the world. Lipsky's body was recovered the next day, it was found by the very same Tarek Omar we talked about earlier. He was personally asked to do so by the dead guy's mother. 
It is noteworthy that Omar had previously twice warned Yuri against trying to dive. That's an eerie and sad story related to one of the most beautiful places on Earth. And now we're going to dive into another place with a similar name, the Great Blue Hole. It is located off the coast of Belize, a state on the east coast of Central America. It is almost the world's largest oceanic sinkhole, measuring 318 meters, 1,043 feet across, and 124 meters, 407 feet deep. By some estimates, it is the second largest after the Dragon Hole in the Paracel Islands region. It was formed when this place was land. The hole was formed as a regular karst sinkhole in several stages between 153,000 and 15,000 years ago during the Quaternary Glaciation. When the sea level rose, it was submerged. In the 1970s, the place was made famous by the legendary explorer Jacques Yves Cousteau. Since then, it has become popular among divers, but its internal structure, features, and what lies at the very bottom remained a mystery for a long time. In 2019, an ambitious and even starry team made an expedition to the Great Blue Hole. Billionaire Richard Branson and Fabian Cousteau, grandson of the legendary explorer, joined Erica Bergman, National Geographic explorer and pilot of the Aquatica submarines. They successfully descended to the bottom of the abyss. This dramatic dive was somewhat similar to entering the atmosphere of a distant planet. That's because as the vessel descended, it passed through layers of water, the chemical composition of which was drastically different from ordinary seawater. And the most prominent role in this was played by hydrogen sulfide. We know this gas well because of its unpleasant odor of rot and rotten eggs. It's a permanent companion of almost any organic decomposition process. In high concentrations, it's toxic. So, descending into the depths of the Great Blue Hole, at a certain point, the sensors of the vessel recorded a sharp increase in the concentration of this gas. It happened at a depth of about 88 to 90 meters, 290 to 300 feet. A layer of dissolved hydrogen sulfide covered the entire hole. How did it get there? And can it be dangerous? Here, the explorers got a much more thrilling experience than they had expected. The layer of gas actually outlined a conditional death zone that began at this depth. All living creatures that fell into the hole and died there inevitably decompose, releasing hydrogen sulfide. This gas is poorly soluble in water, and certainly not heavier than it. That's why the concentration had to be high enough for it to stay at such a depth. But decomposition processes, among other things, also consume oxygen. Gradually, all the oxygen in the water at the bottom of the hole ran out. So it happened that nothing could survive from a certain depth level. There was simply no oxygen to breathe. This place is gloomy, not only in the figurative sense, but also in the literal sense. A layer of hydrogen sulfide prevents sunlight, so this hole is not only blue, but also very dark. Hydrogen sulfide, oxygen-free environment, and pitch darkness. This was just the scenery of the eerie picture the intrepid explorers eventually saw. At the bottom of the blue hole, they discovered human bodies. As it turns out, these were the bodies of two of the three missing divers. For ethical reasons, the crew refused to attempt to recover the bodies themselves. They left them buried in the sea and reported the gruesome find to the authorities after surfacing. The crew discovered other things in the blue hole that were not so creepy. On the contrary, they were bizarre and even mesmerizing. These were huge stalactites, stone icicles formed on the ceiling when the blue hole was a regular karst cave, not submerged under the seawater. Stalactites are formed by the slow dripping of water droplets 
and the crystallization of minerals as the droplets dry at the very tip of the mineral stone. Some of them are over 12 meters, 40 feet long, and 0.6 meters, 2 feet in diameter. Interestingly, the stalactites in the hole were tilted 12 degrees, although they can only form strictly vertically from the cave ceiling. What's the reason? It must be the shift of tectonic plates over the last 100,000 years. This is quite possible, as even whole continents tilt due to the slipping and sliding of tectonic plates. Now, let's leave this gloomy, though undeniably scenic place and move on to the beaches. As you can easily guess, not ordinary beaches, but dangerous ones. This Florida beach has been called the shark bite capital of the world. Why? Because you are 10 times more likely to be bitten by a shark here than anywhere else in the United States. Florida has some of the most stunning beaches in the United States, and they're always packed with visitors. However, one of these beaches has been hitting the headlines in recent years, but not at all because of its beauty. Yes, we are talking about New Smyrna Beach, which boasts 27 kilometers, 17 miles of beautiful coastline. Surfers flock here for amazing waves. The New Smyrna Beach area is also known around the world for its family-friendly attractions, restaurants, and stores. But amidst this idyllic location, there is one major drawback. There have been multiple terrifying shark encounters on the beach in recent years. For example, in September 2023, a 38 year old surfer was bitten in the face by a shark as he was coming off a wave. In total, there have been five shark incidents at New Smyrna Beach in 2023. And a year earlier, in September 2022, a 27 year old woman was walking chest deep in water when a shark bit her on the right side of her body. Do you feel like these are sporadic incidents not worth paying much attention to? Well, it depends. According to the International Shark Attack file, there are nine unprovoked shark attacks per year in Volusia County, where New Smyrna Beach is located. And these are just the cases of actual direct attacks. Meanwhile, there have been so many cases of a shark circling around an unsuspecting surfer and pondering whether to attack him or not. According to the same file, anyone swimming at New Smyrna Beach was within 3 meters, 10 feet of a shark. This makes attack statistics look a bit less insignificant, doesn't it? You might think this fact discourages people from visiting this Florida beach, right? It's quite the opposite. Many surfers who hope to catch a glimpse of sharks only get a greater surfing experience from the abundance of sharks. But back to the question of what attracts sharks to New Smyrna Beach. You probably didn't know this, but most shark bites actually occur near the surf zones. There's actually a quite logical explanation for this. Surfers and sharks seem to prefer the same areas of shore, and if we can say so, the same types of water. Both sharks and surfers like the part of the ocean where the waves smash against the rising shoreline. Their goals differ. Surfers come here to have fun, and sharks to hunt. At high tide, large and small fish head for the shallow waters in search of food, digging in the water plants along the seashores. That's where they fall prey to sharks. Ironically, sharks do not actually have anything against humans, let alone consciously hunt them. Almost all attacks, including fatal ones, happen by mistake. Sharks mistake a dabbling bather or surfer for a large tasty fish and therefore attack them. And sensing that there is obviously something wrong, literally spits out the poor victim. The trouble is that even a light bite from a terrible shark's mouth is often enough to cause fatal wounds. And now we move to another location in the ocean with an equally creepy nickname. If you ever travel to the beautiful Hawaiian island of Kauai, you can visit the so-called Pool of Death in the town of Princeville on the north shore of the island. 
It received this ominous name because of the frequent drownings of swimmers, even experienced ones. Another name for this place, Queen's Bath, dates back to the times when the local aristocracy bathed there. What is this place? It is a small cove surrounded by rocky walls. It is notorious for its sudden high tides and is considered extremely dangerous for bathing. But how can the tide be sudden? They happen on a regular schedule, don't they? That's right, but the shoreline structure here is such that the high tide is fast, rough, and chaotic. And if you don't stand on the shore and wait for it with a stopwatch, it can really catch you by surprise. The water here can turn from calm to chaos in a matter of seconds, posing a deadly threat. A careless swimmer can be smashed against the rocks by a wave, dragged to the bottom where he won't have enough air to swim out. Or they can get carried away into the ocean where he certainly won't have any chance. Despite the obvious dangers, Queen's Bath remains a popular Kauai attraction. Visitors regularly sneak here, ignoring authorities' efforts to install fences, strengthen safety, and renew warning signs. There is often jamming in the parking lot at the trail leading to the Queen's Bath. The period from fall to spring, when the gates to the site remain closed, is when danger is at its peak. However, this doesn't deter thrill-seekers either, quite the opposite. Alas, for some, this adventure was the last. In total, there are at least 30 known deaths associated with this place. On the way to the pool, you will see a stone plaque warning that unexpected large waves can wash you off the rocks into the ocean. Other signs explicitly say, danger, many people have drowned here. It is said that violators can be sued. Like if you have to be rescued, you will pay for it later with money. You have been warned. At least one person who needed help at Queen's Bath did get a bill. This was personally claimed by county spokeswoman Kim Tamaoka. But none of that stopped the company of three men in October 2023. The intrepid swimmers decided to challenge the notorious pool of death. A photographer who was present captured the trio repeatedly jumping into the water, unaware of the ominous turn of events that might await them in this charming but treacherous pool. While they were enjoying the pastime, the water level dropped dramatically and then rose sharply. Two of the friends were carried off the rocks into the turbulent water, and the third jumped to his friends for some unknown reason. Maybe he wanted to rescue them, or on the spur of the moment, did not realize the danger and did not understand what was happening. Struggling with the ruthless waves, they tried their best to stay afloat and get to a safe place among the rocks. At the end of the video, we can see two of them successfully climbing the rocks, but the fate of the third remains unknown. But this place is dangerous for another reason as well. The path to Queen's Bath is very steep, and often tourists get sprains, fractures, and heart attacks along the way. So if you are seeking a thrill, think carefully before heading here, just so that things don't get too thrilling. And now we move on to a place that has scared the hell out of even the bravest of seafarers for centuries. Imagine waking up in a ship's cabin with the dizzying sensation as if your bed is swinging in a hammock. The unpredictable lurching of the ship tosses chairs and everything in the cabin. The walls, ceiling, and floor creak as if everything is about to fall apart. By midday, the wave reaches 6 to 8 meters, 20 to 26 feet, and the wind is 50 knots, that is 92 kilometers per hour. 57 miles per hour. The crew turns the ship a few degrees east of the planned route so that the waves hit the side with at least a little less force. Yes, it's a real storm, but still pretty moderate compared to what the Drake Passage you are in is capable of. You could easily have caught 11 to 12 meter, 
35 to 40 foot waves here too. Imagine that the waves gradually subsided the next day, and the next morning, you came across an iceberg, a block of ice 549 meters, 600 yards in diameter. The Antarctic is nigh hand, and so are the humpback whales you can admire. Assuming, of course, you can distract yourself from watching a drifting iceberg that evokes unpleasant associations with the Titanic. The Drake Passage is the body of water between South America's Cape Horn, Chile, Argentina, and the South Shetland Islands of Antarctica. It connects the southwestern Atlantic Ocean with the southeastern Pacific Ocean. The passage is named after the 16th century English explorer Sir Francis Drake. Despite the fact that the passage bears this name, the Encyclopedia Britannica and other modern sources report that in reality, the English captain was not the first to pass through it. It was done only in 1616 by the expedition of Flemish navigator Willem Schutem, and Drake just discovered this intercontinental passage. The average depth of the passage is about 3,400 meters, 11,000 feet, with deeper areas reaching 4,800 meters, 15,600 feet near the northern and southern boundaries. Its width is also impressive and makes 998 kilometers, 620 miles, which is roughly the distance from London to Berlin. It is the widest passage on the planet. And with such dimensions, the passage is considered one of the most dangerous to navigate. The water in the passage is far from stagnant, with a strong eastward current. The severe climate brings frequent and violent storms, which are exacerbated by the proximity of Antarctica, an inexhaustible source of dangerous icebergs. Historically, the passage is literally a graveyard of numerous ships that tried to pass it against the currents and winds. It has had a sad fame since the time of Magellan and up to the opening of the Panama Canal, which drew almost all the most important routes of South America. Nowadays, of course, this route is much safer than in the past, but incidents still happen here. Just recently, in December 2022, the ship Viking Polaris, going through the Drake Passage to the Argentine city of Ushea, had bad luck. A so-called rogue wave crashed against it, causing damage. Some passengers even thought they had run into an iceberg. As a result, four passengers were injured, and 62-year-old Sherry Zhu died. So this place is still considered dangerous. Safe navigation through the passage in relatively calm weather is possible only for cargo ships of very large displacement, such as tankers and container ships of the Panamax class, large warships, and submarines. Well, we head further out to dive into another dangerous part of the world ocean, Queensland, Australia. Why are the waters of Queensland dangerous? There are predators here that use ambush tactics, such as lying in wait at the water's edge to catch their prey. These are crocodiles. Their habitat, North Queensland, is known as croc country. But of course, they can also be found beyond its borders. Did you know that crocodiles can stay underwater for more than an hour and can hide completely, even in knee-deep shallow water? So if you don't see a crocodile, it doesn't mean it's not around. Crocodiles are most active at night, at dusk and dawn. They may move upstream during high tides and floods and may move into new areas where they have not been seen before. The smaller the vessel, the greater risk of meeting crocodiles. There have been cases of them dragging people off small boats. Despite this, visitors to North Queensland often ignore numerous crocodile warning signs. But locals know very well that these signs are there for a reason. Crocodiles are an obvious and real danger in the North. The controversy about crocodiles was revived with renewed vigor in 2023, after the death of fisherman Kevin Darmati. He fell victim to two reptiles at once. There have been 47 attacks on humans in North Queensland since 1985, and their frequency has increased menacingly lately. 
and this issue has a long history. In the 1970s, crocodiles were almost completely exterminated in this area, but almost. The predators quickly recovered their population. Now, there are tens of thousands of them. The State Department of Environment predicts that the population will continue to grow by 2.2% per year, and it is already well underway. Crocodiles have been seen even in the South, outside of what is traditionally regarded as croc country. In other words, they have begun to expand their territory. However, after an extensive study in 2021, the department said it is unlikely that the crocodile population in the South will ever reach the level of the Northern Territory. The reason is the limited area of suitable habitat. But crocodiles are not the only dangerous creatures in Queensland. It is also home to the blue-ringed octopus. These animals get their name because of the iridescent blue marks they display when threatened. Sometimes they even appear in Sydney. In March 2023, one such octopus bit a woman on Sydney's North Shore several times while she was swimming. Blue-ringed octopuses are extremely venomous. These creatures produce a fast-acting toxin that causes paralysis, depresses respiratory centers, and inevitably leads to death in just 15 minutes unless the victim gets qualified help. So the woman who got bitten in Sydney was really lucky to survive this. Now we're going to South Africa. The Cape of Good Hope awaits us there. Despite its peaceful name, the area is notorious for numerous shipwrecks. Thousands of ships have met their doom here, and the Cape remains very treacherous to this day. The Cape is located at the southern tip of the Cape Peninsula, south of Cape Town, the second largest city in the Republic of South Africa after Johannesburg. Interestingly, it was originally named Cape of Storms in the 1840s by Portuguese explorer Bartolomeu Dias. Allegedly, the name was mentioned in a report to the Portuguese King John II because Dias described conditions around the Cape as very rough. It was later renamed Cape of Good Hope to attract more people to the Cape Sea Route. According to another version, the King of Portugal, encouraged by Diaz's discovery, named it Cape of Good Hope because it offered a promising prospect of reaching the markets of India. Over time, the Cape became an important port and staging area for soldiers traveling from Europe to Asia. However, the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 provided a much shorter way from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean making the long voyage around Africa inefficient. So why are the waters near the Cape, where the Atlantic and Indian Oceans meet, so dangerous for ships? The thing is that the warm current from the east meets the cold current from the northwest there, and with strong winds typical for the area, the conditions for shipping become bleak. It is no wonder that the Cape of Good Hope is associated with the legend of the Flying Dutchman a ghost ship doomed to sail the oceans forever. According to the legend, while trying to round the Cape of Good Hope, the ship got into a strong storm. The navigator suggested to wait out the bad weather in a safe place, for example, somewhere in the bay. But the fierce captain shot him and a few other disgruntled sailors and then swore that none of the crew would go ashore until they rounded the Cape even if it would take eternity. A voice from the sky said, let it be so. In all, at least 2,000 ships have sunk in South African waters, one for every kilometer, 0.6 miles of coastline on average. Ships sink around the Cape more often than in many parts of the open ocean. Many of them date back to the days of European exploration and voyages to India and Asia but not all of them. In 1911, a year before the Titanic sank in the Atlantic, the passenger liner SS Lusitania had mistaken Cape Town's lighthouse for the southernmost point of the continent, turned too steeply and wrecked, hitting land. A couple of years earlier, dozens of other ships had also misjudged the situation due to that ill-fated lighthouse, so it was later moved further south. 
Another similarly notorious and even epic incident occurred in 1942. The U.S. warship SS Thomas Tucker ran aground at Cape Point during its maiden voyage and was washed ashore. The ship was loaded with nothing less than Sherman tanks, trucks, spare parts, and barbed wire. It was on its way to the Suez Canal where the Allies were engaged in a North African campaign against Hitler's forces. In an attempt to avoid an encounter with an Italian patrol submarine, the captain changed course and headed straight for Cape Olas Fonsbos in thick fog. Only then did the captain discover that his compass had deviated 37 degrees, but it was too late. The rescue effort took as long as five months, and it was a great undertaking. But the valuable cargo was worth it, and eventually most of it was saved. The wreck of the Thomas Tucker still lies on the rocks of Cape Olafonsbos. Now, South Africa even offers tourists a special route, the Shipwreck Trail, along the part of the coast where at least 120 ships, including the Thomas Tucker, were lost between 1682 and 1992. That's the good hope this cape sometimes brings. And now, we're going to visit an area of the Pacific Ocean with a similarly evocative name. On October 1st, 2023, a sailor named Felix Louis Najai from the Bay Area on the coast of Northern California was reported missing. Before that, he had been swimming with two friends at the beach. According to witnesses, they saw a shark nearby. People also noticed a blood puddle where the swimmer, where the swimmer was last seen the alleged victim of the great white shark has not been found. This part of the shoreline is in the area infamously known as the Red Triangle, which is the colloquial name for the roughly triangular shaped region. From the shore, you have a serene view of beautiful beaches full of sea lions and seals. However, things are not so serene in the water. During the fall months, an unseen danger lurks in the seawaters off the California coast, the Great White Shark. Considering the high population in the few areas of the world where white sharks live, those who enjoy ocean leisure in California are at great risk of encountering these predators. Yes, yes, dangers from toothy predators await not only at New Smyrna Beach, which we covered earlier in the video. A preliminary assessment conducted in 2006 found that about 38% of reported great white shark attacks on humans in the United States happened specifically in the Red Triangle area. At the time, this amounted to 11% of the global rate. In the last 30 years since 1993, there have been six fatalities caused by white sharks in California. However, the number of non-fatal human encounters with white sharks in the South has increased in recent years. Such incidents are occurring throughout the state, with one of the highest rates seen in Southern California. This is directly related to the increase in white shark populations since California began a campaign aimed at protecting the species in 1994. From 2014 to 2019, Tourist cage dives were practiced to observe sharks within the Guadalupe Island Biosphere Reserve. The data indicated a gradual increase in the overall population of great white sharks. And in 2014 to 2016, unprecedented cases of appearances of young white sharks were recorded in Central California. They were mostly individuals with a body length of less than 2.5 meters, 8 feet. Previously, the young preferred to stay in the warmer waters of the Southern California current. Despite the case of 2023, Stanford scientists claim that the chances of being bitten or moreover eaten by a shark are still very small. According to the study, scuba divers are 6,897 times more likely to be hospitalized due to diving-related decompression sickness than white shark bites. Divers have a 1 in 136 million chance of being bitten, while surfers have a 1 in 17 million chance. Nevertheless, when bathing in the Red Triangle area, be aware of the risks, even the small ones. Or better yet, sail further with us. 
This is the strangest and even paradoxical sea on the planet. It's teeming with life and yet capable of insidious murder. It has the calmest weather, but has always been one of the areas with the most ship sinkings. It doesn't even have shores. A sea without shores, a sea of wreckage, a sea of ghosts, a desert in the ocean. Such nicknames were given to this part of the Atlantic Ocean. By the way, most of the infamous Bermuda Triangle is located in the Sargasso Sea. Coincidence? Let's look into it. First of all, what does a sea without shores mean? How can something like that exist? The point is that its boundaries are defined not by land, but by ocean currents. Yes, this is largely a matter of agreement and compromise among scientists, not a clear definition. But in this case, there was no other option. This area of the ocean is just too unusual. The sea is bounded to the west by the Gulf Stream, to the north by the North Atlantic Current, to the east by the Canary Current, and to the south by the North Atlantic Equatorial Current. All four together form a clockwise circulating system of ocean currents called the North Atlantic Gyre. The Sargasso Sea is located approximately between 20 degrees and 35 degrees north latitude and 40 degrees and 70 degrees west longitude. It is approximately 1,100 kilometers, 600 nautical miles wide, and 3,200 kilometers, 1,750 nautical miles long. Bermuda is near the western end of the sea. Okay, first oddity solved. But still, why are there so many terrifying legends and myths about it? Indeed, this area has scared even the most courageous navigators since the time of Columbus. And even Christopher Columbus personally expressed his concerns, fearing that this place might become a grave for the entire expedition. So what is this ominous force? The answer is surprisingly simple and trivial. Algae. Yes, it's the seaweed from which the sea got its name. Sargassum is a genus of marine brown algae that floats on the surface of the ocean. It's very viable and vigorously growing. It is found in many places in the Atlantic, but in the Sargasso Sea, due to the circular current, it accumulates in enormous quantities. This made sailing very difficult during the age of exploration. Indeed, many ships were sunk here because of the algae. The algae itself made navigation difficult, but it also hampered sailors' ability to determine depth, which increased the risk of running aground. It wasn't just algae that caused trouble for sailors of the past. Due to the same circular current inside the Sargasso Sea, the weather is mostly too calm and windless. This is an advantage for modern ships, but for sailing ships, it's a disaster. The fact is that a sailing ship needs at least some wind to be able to move, even an adverse wind. Sailing ships can move even against the wind, and dead calm is the worst case. There were many cases where ships were stuck in such a windless trap in the Sargasso Sea for many days, and the crew suffered from lack of food and fresh water. It is the combination of these unique features that has brought this area of the Atlantic such notoriety. Nowadays, there's a new threat from Sargasso. There is too much of it so much that huge amounts of rotting algae are washed ashore, creating a real ecological disaster. Giant multi-meter layers of decaying algae release hydrogen sulfide and other harmful gases, which in such volumes may endanger the health of the coastal region's residents. And finally, we move on to another strange part of the ocean. There are many different legends about this place. What they have in common is that they all mention missing ships and ghost ships drifting without crew. This is the Devil's Sea, or Mano Umi in Japanese. In fact, it's a phrase the Japanese use commonly to describe dangerous sea places around the world. So there are many places called Mano Umi, but this one is special. 
These infamous waters are located around the Miyake, a Japanese island about 100 kilometers south of Tokyo. There are other names for the place, the Pacific Bermuda Triangle and the Dragon's Triangle. The dragon in the name comes from a Chinese myth about dragons living underwater. According to the myths, these underwater dragons attack ships passing by. The stories began circulating as far back as 1,000 years ago. It is said that the conqueror Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan, tried to invade Japan in 1274 and 1281 AD. However, he failed in both attempts. He lost his ships and 40,000 crew members in this triangular zone reportedly due to typhoons. The Japanese then believed it was higher forces who sent the typhoons to save them from their enemies. Later, divers and marine archaeologists discovered the remains of the Mongolian fleet in this region. Another legend dates back to the early 1800s. It describes a mysterious woman sailing through the Devil's Sea in a ship that looked like a jar for burning incense but it is still unknown what kind of ship it was and where it was headed, and whether it was there at all, because at the time, there could not be any reliable evidence, even theoretically, so that you and I could check out the proof. But in the mid-20th century, things were better. Besides, the ships didn't stop disappearing in this place. In the 1940s and 1950s, several fishing vessels and more than five warships disappeared in the area. In 1952, Japan sent a research vessel to investigate the cases of ships missing without a trace in the Dragon Triangle. But it too suffered the same fate of its predecessors. The wreckage was later found, but its 31-man crew was missing. After this incident, the Japanese government declared this area dangerous for sea travel and transportation of goods. Moreover, all attempts to uncover the facts behind the mystery were also thwarted. But people still plotted hypotheses, trying to give a scientific explanation for the so-called paranormal phenomena occurring there. Among them, of course, were also people who had a rather indirect relation to science. According to British-American naturalist Ivan Sanderson, ships disappear in the Devil's Sea because of the complex interaction of hot and cold currents. And this might have been a reasonable version, but Sanderson attributed this to some obscure changes in the state of the electromagnetic field that capture passing ships. The reputation of Sanderson, fond of everything paranormal, left his theories in the camp of ufologists and conspiracy theorists. Another less unscientific hypothesis suggests that there are underwater volcanoes in the area. Their eruption could be the cause of shipwrecks and the source of stories about dragons pulling ships with crews underwater. An even sounder scientific study says that shipwrecks happened because of methane hydrate. This gas often accumulates in natural reservoirs on the ocean floor and can pose a serious threat to ships. Bursting from the deposits, the gas sharply reduces the density of water, which leads to a sudden and rapid sinking of the ship. This reason, by the way, is referred to as a scientific explanation for the disappearance of ships in the Bermuda Triangle as well. Clearly, this is far from all the dangerous places in the world ocean, and of course, on the Earth. There are still locations on our planet that defy the laws of nature. No matter how advanced the science is, thousands of researchers continue to speculate and build the most incredible hypotheses explaining how these places appeared on Earth. Let's now take a tour through some of them, where we'll experience the silent zone, learn about gravity hills and double trees, find unusual lights in the sky and a boiling river, hide from lightning, and at the end, reach a place that will first repulse then fascinate you. 15 Most Unusual Places on Earth We are in the deep Siberian taiga in Russia, in a place that both people and animals avoid. This is the Potomsky Crater, or Potom Crater, or for locals, 
the fiery eagle's nest. The size of this crater is impressive. It reaches a height of about 40 meters, 131 feet, and its diameter at the ridge is 76 meters, 249 feet. It's impossible to miss the gloomy gray mountain with a flat top that looks like it was cut off with a blade against a background of bright green vegetation. More than 70 years have passed since its discovery, and scientists still don't understand the origins of the crater. If this is a trace of a meteorite fall, then where did the meteorite debris and fusion crust go? If secret nuclear tests were conducted here, then why is the radiation background not high at all? The expedition sent to the crater in 2005 wanted to find definite answers to these and other questions. But unfortunately, just five kilometers from the site, the mission was terminated due to the sudden death of the expedition's head. This story increased the mysticism around the Potom Crater. But the research of the puzzling site continued. Scientists made different hypotheses. Some suggested that the crater is the place of the fall of a super strong cylindrical object, which squeezed out rock pieces to the top and struck at a depth of 100 to 300 meters, 328 to 984 feet. There were also fantastic versions about traces from a fragment of a quark star, the existence of which is assumed only theoretically. One of the latest theories claims that the Potom Crater is still of volcanic nature and belongs to gas volcanoes formed by methane emissions. Either way, there is still no evidence for this theory, which means that the mystery of the fire eagle's nest is still unsolved. From Russia, we head west to North America. Here, 40 kilometers, 25 miles from Ceballos, Mexico, and 650 kilometers, 404 miles from the American city of El Paso, Texas, lies a place where all equipment fails to work. This is the Mapimi Silent Zone. At first glance, this strip of desert doesn't seem noteworthy at all. Wherever you look, there is a dreary plain with thorny bushes and cacti. But according to Santiago Garcia, a Mexican historian and politician, people knew about the strangeness of this place in the middle of the 19th century, seeing hot rocks falling from the sky to the ground. Later, locals began to talk about plants and animals with various mutations and deformities found here. However, the desert strip gained close attention only in the 70s, when the American experimental ballistic Athena rocket suddenly deviated from the course and collapsed in the middle of the silent zone. The US sent a special team to the crash site to remove all the wreckage. The rescue operation launched a new wave of myths and legends about the place. One more hearsay was added to the rumors about strange magnetic anomalies, mutations of flora and fauna, Locals told about seeing unusual wanderers of very high stature, or on the contrary, very small. However, no evidence of any of the anomalies of the zone was found. But this does not mean that the stories about radio signal loss were completely false. There are mountain ranges around the silent zone that could possibly cause some interference. The only other feature of the area, though also lacking evidence, is the high magnetite and uranium levels in the soil. Today, the Silent Zone attracts experienced tourists and continues to evoke myths and tales, partly due to local residents and guides for whom this desolate piece of land is a great opportunity to make money. Malfunctioning equipment and a failing compass in the middle of the desert can really scare any tourist. But what would you say about a place where any object becomes stone? It's hard to believe, but in the county of North Yorkshire, UK, in the Mother Shipton's Cave, there is a well of water in which the petrification of any object takes months, not millennia. So what is it? A medieval curse or a natural process with a solid evidence base? In the 16th century, people really believed that the witch Ursula Southheel or Mother Shipton had cast a spell on the well. 
the creepiness of the cave where the well was located was enhanced by its resemblance to a giant skull when viewed from the side. These spurious facts were enough to be sure that the place was cursed by the devil. Scientists have dispelled this myth. The magic of the water in the well lies in its mineral origin. Water analysis revealed high concentrations of calcium carbonate and calcium sulfate, which promote the deposition of calcareous tuff, a type of limestone. The solidification process is not true petrification. It is more like the formation of a stalactite. That is, the molecules of the origin object are not replaced by molecules of the stone or mineral, but overlap. And although the legend of the cursed well has shattered on the hard rock of science, tourists continue to come to the country of Yorkshire from all over the world to see with their own eyes a unique natural phenomenon. On another continent in Minnesota, USA, Travelers and researchers are trying to solve the mystery of the waterfall with an eerie name, Devil's Kettle. The thing is that in the place where the Brule River splits into two streams, one stream falls down a rocky ledge, and the second one falls into a mysterious vortex and disappears without a trace. This waterfall keeps the scientists restless. Various things were thrown into the bubbling stream to trace the place where the underground stream exits. GPS trackers, ping pong balls, and colored dyes were used. Locals say even TV sets and cars were thrown into the devil's kettle to attempt to track where the objects would surface. But the vortex absorbed everything that fell into it and returned nothing. Jeff Green hydrologist of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources in Rochester, Minnesota, got the closest to solving the mystery of the Devil's Kettle. The scientist measured the volume of water before it splits into two streams, and then compared it to the volume of water downstream. Green concluded that there was virtually no difference, which means that the water flowing into the vortex somehow makes its way back into the river. When asked where all the objects thrown into the waterfall went, the scientists suggested that they were either broken by the immense pressure of the water or held underwater by the powerful whirlpool. In any case, Green was unable to find the point where the water resurfaces. He could only assume that the Devil's Kettle Falls flows out right before where it flows in. This means new experiments and tests for researchers in the near future. But let's move back to another continent, to the north. In Norway, since the 1930s, locals and researchers have been puzzling over the nature of the differently shaped luminous objects that appear at different intervals over the Hesdalen Valley. They have different colors, from white to red shades. Some lights hover over the plane for a long time, others pulse like disco lights, and others sweep across the sky and leave visible traces behind. The most lights are observed during the cold season from 2200 to 0100, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. The nature of this phenomenon has fascinated scientists so much that the Hesdalen AMS Automatic Measuring Station was established near the village in 1998 to make observations. Equipped with cameras, radar, and a number of other instruments to record environmental parameters, the station records unusual lights around the clock. But alas, there is still no answer to the main question of where they come from and what they are made of. The researchers have many versions. Some see the origin of the mysterious lights in the deposits of scandium in the Hestalen Valley. Allegedly, it affects the still not fully investigated process of dust combustion involving oxygen, hydrogen, titanium, and other elements. Other scientists believe the lights are formed by a cluster of microscopic Coulomb crystals in the plasma. Dusty plasma is generated through the decay of radon and the release of ionizing radiation. Some support the hypothesis of Hesdalen lights as a product of piezoelectricity. 
This is a process in which during the compression or stretching of some natural crystals, electrical charges arise on the crystal faces. Many crystal rocks in the Hesdalen Valley contain quartz grains, which in turn create an electrical charge. But so far, there is no evidence for either theory, which means the Hesdalen lights continue to be the most persistent, unidentified atmospheric phenomena in recent history. While Romania cannot offer such vivid aerial highlights, it is virtually unmatched in the realm of caves, especially when it comes to a cave that has been hidden from human eyes for 500,000 years. Moville Cave was accidentally discovered in 1986 during construction work. Considering the abundance of caves in Romania, this discovery could well have been an ordinary one if it were not for the special characteristics of the new object. Scientists were struck not only by the age of the cave, which amounted to five million years, but also by the composition of living creatures, along with the chemical composition of the atmosphere. In a completely closed ecosystem lived more than 50 species of living creatures, 37 of which cannot be found anywhere else. There are water scorpions, leeches, spiders, and centipedes here. Staying millions of years in total darkness, many of them have lost coloration and the ability to see. But another astonishing thing is that all the wildlife exists perfectly well in a place that is not only dark, but also has half as much oxygen as the air we breathe. There are also poisonous substances such as methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide and the underground tunnels contain as much as 116 times more carbon dioxide than it is contained in ordinary air. For comparison, there is 0.03% of carbon dioxide in normal air and 3.5% in Moville Cave. It is because of the increased concentration of substances that this place is considered very poisonous and dangerous for humans. Now, the cave is carefully protected from outsiders. Only 30 scientists are permitted to enter the cave. Unlike Movial Cave, the Great Blue Hole is open to anyone who is not afraid to dive into the huge sinkhole near the coast of Belize in the Atlantic Ocean. If one takes a look at this natural wonder from above, it seems that someone dropped a big blue blot on the turquoise surface of the ocean. The Blue Hole which is a sinkhole in the sea, is below sea level, so the color of the water in it differs from the waters of the ocean. The point is that 15,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, the world's ocean level was 100 meters, 328 feet lower than it is now. At that time, this region consisted of a system of limestone caves that gradually went underwater as sea levels rose. Under the water pressure, the cave arches collapsed to form these circular sinkholes. Until 1971, when the famous French explorer Jacques Yves Cousteau dived to the bottom of the Great Blue Hole, people ascribed this place to extraterrestrial origins or ancient civilizations that had hidden valuable artifacts at the bottom of the sinkhole. Cousteau confirmed the theory of natural origin of the hole and also measured its exact depth, 124 meters, 407 feet. However, it is not recommended to go below 90 meters, 295 feet, even for experienced divers. Meeting a layer of toxic hydrogen sulfide and then a real cemetery of dead mollusks and other creatures will definitely not add positive emotions. Another peculiarity of this place is appearing in Google search results for the search query Mariana Trench. But you should not trust the search engine in this case, because the Mariana Trench is a huge rift of thousands of kilometers, not just a hole in the sea near the coast of Belize. Now we're heading to Piedmont, Italy. This region is famous not only for its fine wines and truffles. Here, between the towns of Grana and Casorzo, a unique double tree grows. It consists of two trees. A cherry tree towers above the mulberry tree. 
No one knows how the cherry tree managed to take root and survive in such a strange position. But one popular theory claims that it is possible for one plant to grow atop another. These plants are called epiphytic plants and are commonly found in nature. They include orchids, some species of pineapples, ferns, and cacti. But epiphytes are usually small in size and do not live very long. The double tree of Casorzo, or Bialbero di Casorzo, challenges all epiphytes because it is many years old, and the cherry tree alone is now no less than 5 meters, 16 feet in size. So where did such a strange tree come from? According to one popular theory, a cherry seed was dropped onto a mulberry tree by a bird. The cherry tree seed then gradually sprouted down the trunk of the mulberry tree and eventually took root in the soil. Amazingly enough, the two trees have gotten along just fine for many decades. They both get enough water, sunlight, nutrients from the soil, and even space. Without further words, let's take one last moment to admire this miracle tree and move on to Kazakhstan, to a place dubbed Sleepy Hollow by journalists. There are no unique plants or architectural masterpieces in the village of Kalachi, but once you're there, you can lose your memory, feel weak, experience hallucinations, and even suddenly fall asleep for a couple of days. This doesn't sound well, does it? When cases of sickness among locals became more frequent, the town raised the alarm. Investigations of the air, soil, and water in the village began. Dozens of hypotheses related to food, chronic diseases, or bad habits of the locals were ruled out, and scientists switched their attention to the abandoned uranium mines nearby. Thus, for example, Increased radon content in the air was detected, but experts concluded that radon cannot cause sleeping sickness. Then some of the researchers focused their attention on the underground water. It turned out that all the villagers took drinking water from the same source. Byron Crape, a professor of epidemiology at Nazarbayev University, became interested in this version and was convinced that chemicals that had gotten into the groundwater could be to blame. The professor believes that there could be a chemical weapons factory, of course, a secret one, near the village of Kalachi. The factory workers could have thrown a barrel with chemical waste into one of the inactive uranium mines. The barrel corroded, leaked, and the chemicals seeped into the water. Unfortunately, crepe can't prove or disprove this theory yet. It's too risky to go down into the uranium mine to take samples. It could collapse at any time. However, the official version of sleeping sickness is different now. Because of uranium deposits, gases are occasionally released from the bowels of the earth, and then the content of oxygen in the air decreases while the content of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide rises. By the way, it's been seven years without a single case of sleeping sickness in the village of Kalachi, and scientists still hope to solve the mystery of the phenomenon of the sleepy village. And now we're heading to the Namibian desert. Sure, there are national parks with amazing animals and the highest dunes on the planet but we are looking for something else. In Namib Rand Nature Reserve, you can meet magic circles, a phenomenon that has been puzzling scientists for more than a hundred years. The entire surface of the desert, over 2,000 kilometers, 1,243 miles, is studded with mysterious grass-like circles scattered like peas. Rounded areas of bare earth are fringed with grass, while there is no grass in the center of the circle, and no circle ever overlaps another. In addition, the magic circles behave like living ones. They appear and vanish. Scientists have even managed to establish the life cycle of the circle, from 30 to 60 years. But where did these strange circles in the desert come from? Today, scientists have two versions of the origin of the magic circles. One theory ascribes the phenomenon to a particular species of termite, 
Samotermes alloceras. Termites bury themselves in sand and damage plant roots. The excess rainwater seeps into the sandy soil before the plants can absorb it. The termites need it to maintain a certain body humidity. As a result, the plants die off in a circle away from where the insects nest, and supporters of the second theory argue that the cause of the magic circles is a war between plants for moisture and territory. In an arid desert environment, plants have to self-organize and compete for resources, settling in such a way to use most of the available water. But both theories could not fully explain the phenomenon of magic circles in Namibia. If termites are to blame, how can the tall grass around the perimeter of the circle be explained? If it's all about plant behavior, then why do the circles appear and disappear? Or why are they not found in other regions of the planet with similar natural conditions? A third group of scientists took the two theories and combined them. And then everything fell into place. The researchers created a model of the Namibian circles where termites and plants interacted with each other. Termites removed vegetation from the surface of their dwellings to keep moisture for themselves. And the vegetation along the perimeter of the termite nests benefits from the excess moisture and begins to grow vigorously. The number of questions has decreased, but the debate among scientists about the magic circles still continues. By the way, can you hear the hum right now? You probably don't if you're in a room with good soundproofing, but you surely know the feeling when there is nowhere to hide from the unpleasant sound when, for example, machinery is working nearby. Now imagine that a barely audible humming sound haunts you always and everywhere. You can't hide from it. You can't turn it off or not even pause it. This is the situation faced by more than 100 people living in Taos, New Mexico, USA. People eventually appealed to the authorities with a request to find the source of the maddening sound and eliminate it. Congress gathered a team of scientists to try to solve the problem of the hum. The hum was persistent. It was not heard by all residents. The sound itself was low frequency, between 30 and 80 hertz. The hum was noticed not only by the residents of Taos, but also those living in the surrounding area. The hum also caused health problems for some people. Residents reported dizziness, insomnia, and high blood pressure. The researchers conducted a sampling. Out of 1,440 residents, 2% of the people heard the hum. When all external sources were checked, the team of scientists focused on determining the sound sensitivity of the group of people who heard the hum. The study's result surprised everyone. The scientists found that a small percentage of locals had developed a special sensitivity to low-frequency sounds and heard them all the time, while other people were unable to perceive this sound. For comparison, the human voice frequencies start at 85 hertz, low male voice, or 165 hertz, low female voice. Dr. Nick Begich and Patrick Flanagan went further and offered another version of the noise's origin. In their opinion, the locals have developed a unique ability to distinguish noise from the electromagnetic field, but no proof of either theory was found. In the end, a scientific report was published according to which the distinctive hum was attributed to the physiological features of some people and various hearing disorders. But this version still does not seem so reliable. If you're tired of the Taos hum, it's time to head to the lightning capital. Where is it? In Venezuela, over Lake Maracaibo, nature puts on a daily light show. At peak hours, up to 28 flashes per minute can be seen here cascades of lightning strikes in the same place for hours, a breathtaking sight for an observer. However, one should remember to take precautions because the probability of lightning strikes in this area is the highest in the world. 250 lightning strikes per square kilometer, 0.4 square miles per year, which amounts to about 1.6 million lightning strikes per year. 
In Egypt, for comparison, lightning occurs once every few years. Catatumbo lightning is an ozone factory. It is believed that 10% of the total ozone on the planet is generated here. Ozone, in turn, is a powerful oxidizer and plays an important role in protecting the Earth from ultraviolet rays. So why is this place so favored by lightning? Previously, there was a popular theory about high uranium content in the ground in this place, which attracts lightning discharges. Then the researchers blamed methane, which is actively emitted from local oil fields. But in 2010, both theories were defeated because the lightning stopped due to drought. Then, scientists got a new theory about the connection between lightning and air humidity. But today, experts tend to think that the reason for the unique natural phenomenon over Lake Maracaibo lies in its location. The lake is surrounded from all sides by high mountains. They trap the heat brought by the trade winds from the Caribbean Sea. Simultaneously, cold air currents from the Andes descend into the basin from the opposite side. As the air masses collide with each other, the warmer air is pushed into the upper atmosphere and condenses there. This is how storm clouds are formed. However, thousands of lightning strikes are just a nature's joke compared to the phenomenon that exists in the Amazon. Can you imagine a river of boiling water? If not, you'll have to take our word for it that Peru has just about the only boiling river in the world. The locals call it Shane Timpishka, which in the tribal language means warmed by the heat of the sun. The river lives up to its name. Its water temperature ranges from 45 degrees Celsius, 113 degrees Fahrenheit, to almost 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Frogs, mice, and snakes are boiled alive in it. And if you dip your hand into the water, you can easily get second or even third degree burns in less than half a second. It is surprising, but in this century of progress, the world community learned about the existence of this river only in 2011, when geologist Andres Russo explored and described it in his works. Today, scientists believe that the Shanae Tempishka River is the largest among thermal rivers. Indeed, it reaches more than six kilometers, four miles in length, and its depth is up to six meters, 20 feet. Even more amazing is the fact that such hot water in the river is not of volcanic origin. The nearest active volcano is more than 700 kilometers, 435 miles away. In order to understand the processes and mechanisms that cause the river to boil, Andres conducted geochemical analyses for five years with annual field sampling. The studies showed that the river's water originally fell as rain. Most likely, somewhere along the way, the rainwater seeps down into the ground. At depth, it is heated with geothermal energy and then returns to the river already hot through fractures and cracks in the Earth's surface. This means we see only a small part of a huge geothermal system. However, scientists still have to find out exactly how the water is heated and how it moves. We have a few minutes to see another wonder. To do this, we're going to Korea, to Jeju Island. Strangely, it's just a paved road to see. What could be interesting here? But let's take a glass bottle and put it on the road. Look, the glass bottle rolls up the slope, breaking the laws of physics and logic. If we put the car in neutral, it will go up the hill, confusing even an experienced driver. Scientists believe that the reason for this is an optical illusion called Gravity Hill. Because of the terrain features, a slight incline looks like a rise. There is indeed a slope of just three degrees. The surrounding area of the road, though, is at elevation. Because of this, it seems to us that the road is going uphill and objects are rolling upwards. Such gravity hills are not rare in nature. But even if it is just an optical illusion, this place is worth a visit for all fans of natural mysteries and mysticism.
Okay, you may think you've seen everything today and nothing else can surprise you, but I have something special for you. I promised you this place would leave you with mixed feelings. Are you ready? Welcome to Antarctica, to Taylor Valley, one of the so-called dry valleys. There is no snow here and powerful winds blow at speeds of up to 300 kilometers per hour, 186.4 miles per hour, sweeping away everything in their way. And it is in one of the harshest places on the planet that Blood Falls is located. Of course, there's no blood in it. But what is it? And why, with an average annual temperature of minus 17 degrees Celsius, 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, is the water in the falls not freezing? First, the bloody color of the water was explained by red algae, which was not found in the water. But scientists got an answer to the question of why the water in the falls does not freeze. In 2017, a team of researchers used geolocation radar to discover a lake of non-freezing salt water underneath the falls. It became clear that the water in the falls was not freezing because salt water freezes at lower temperatures than fresh water. They also found microbes in the lake, which, in the absence of light and oxygen, had to start feeding on the sulfates in the subglacial brine, converting them into sulfites. The sulfites then react with iron dissolved in the water. Most likely, the iron gets into the water from the ground. For years, scientists have been trying to find particles of iron in the water. They've been looking for a mineral, a crystal structure, and they couldn't find it. It was only in the summer of 2023 that experts managed to solve the age-old mystery. A team of scientists led by Ken Levy from John Hopkins University spotted nanospheres, that is, the tiny non-crystalline objects consisting of iron, silicon, calcium, aluminum, and other chemical elements. The authors of the study concluded that meltwater turns red when the iron contained in nanosphere binds with oxygen. And because of the high salinity and the presence of elements such as chlorine, magnesium, and sodium, the water color of Blood Falls is enhanced with yellow and orange hues, which makes it look pretty scary. It seems that mankind has grasped this mystery, but the universe still has many more riddles in its most secluded corners.